Zeke, what's the American dream all about for you? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. Um, I feel the American dream is doing what you love to do. Um, I feel that it's not actually necessarily a constant pursuit, but the idea of being happy. Um, thankfully, I am pursuing my happiness. And um, you know, I live my life that way. Uh, it's been a challenge to get to this point. But I gotta say, like the American dream to me is like literally striving for something, uh, but then achieving and then sharing that with others. Has the concept of the American dream changed for you over time? Absolutely. Yeah, it changed. Um, as I was younger, all I wanted to do was be rich. Um, I have a very different um, upbringing um, where my family started an amusement park. I literally was raised in an amusement park. Uh, we would, I, would, I was the closest one to my grandfather who helped build the park with his two hands. And so we go around and do safety checks and yada, yada, yada. And so I was in the bowels of the, of the, of the uh, amusement park. Um, and so, but the interesting thing about that was, was you saw all these people having a great time and enjoying themselves where we had to work it. You know, so there's this big disconnect of we provided the, the enjoyment for other people, but we didn't participate in it. Um, and so it was, it was um, so not being able to just be always made me strive for something more. And so I thought it was going to be with wealth. I literally wanted to, my original thought was I was going to be on Wall Street. Uh, and you know, and and being a broker or an analyst or whatever, and uh, I got my my taste of that, um, and um, I hated it. I literally walked out one day. I was making a lot of money, and I walked out because it wasn't life for me. So when I was younger, I thought chasing the American dream was a matter of chasing wealth, but now I find the American dream is actually chasing happiness, and having um, and sharing. That's a big thing. So when you were at that Wall Street job and whether you were sitting in a cubicle or in front of a computer, wherever, on the 180th floor, wherever, yeah. did, did, did you have filmmaking in your mind Not or at all. nothing like Not that? At all. No, I, um, it was funny because I walked out before I ever thought I was going to be a filmmaker. Um, and so um, with my entertainment background at the, uh, the park, my finance background, uh, a buddy of mine that was going to NYU film school thought I'd make an excellent producer. Uh, and I knew nothing about producing film whatsoever, and so I started to read as much as I could. I fell in love with it, and I decided that's what I was going to do. And I uh, tucked my way into getting accepted to Syracuse Grad School. And after my first semester, my professor's like, "What the hell are you doing going to school?" And I was like, uh, "I want to be a filmmaker." She's like, "No, go do it. Why spend twenty-seven thousand dollars going to school when you can make a first film for that?" So I moved back home, uh, refinanced the only asset that I had, which is a black Jeep Wrangler. Got $12,000 for it and I started my film company and I've been making movies ever since. And home is? Uh, and now it's on PA. And I moved, I moved back home, um, you know, like all my buddies were going to New York or LA uh, and some in Atlanta at that, even at that time. Um, but I decided I want to move back home because my family literally helped build the area. And because of the Billy Joel song, everybody outside the area thought it was a poor, depressed town, and I knew otherwise. And so I literally moved home to make a difference, um, to you know, share with the world what the Lea Valley was like. And that's kind of like why I, I, I've been on this 20-year mission of doing that, and I haven't acquiesced whatsoever. It's been a struggle. It's been a really, really hard time doing what I'm doing. But we've had two films at Sundance. We've premiered at the London Film Festival. We've, I've had success, thank God. But it came with, with a extraordinary amount of hard work. If you don't mind me asking, did you leave this job before any market crash? This is analyst job or whatever. Oh, this is back in the early '90s. This oh, was, I see. Yeah, so the things this, were going well. Oh yeah, 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 oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I was actually analyzing entertainment stocks on the tax sector, so it was my job to figure out where studios hid their money. Because at oh. that time, all the deals are back end, and so, like for instance, people don't realize that Forrest Gump never made money. Do we believe that? But all the deals are back end, so the producers and the studio would just, you know, put um, put money behind, you know, like basically lose money. They would hide. They'd hide money. And so they never had to pay the back end deals. And so it was a big problem and everything else. And since then, Hollywood's fixed it. But it's just a matter of, um, like, that's kind of like what I did was try to figure out what people were really making. So you left when the going was good, so to speak. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right. I think my mother still is upset about it. Because <laughs> I would have been set, quite honestly. You know, instead of struggling for 20 years, I would have been financially completely stable my entire life. When you looked around, were there other coworkers that seemed satisfied with their jobs? 
well, they would brag about making $30,000 that week. And I looked at them and I said, you know, my sister doesn't even make that an entire year. You know, it's a matter of getting perspective. And the next day I finally walked out. So. Do you still keep in touch with any of them? Do they say, no. hey, how's that movie thing going? No, no, okay. no, no. No, because it's like, it's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, it's funny because in my, when I was younger, I was a lot more conservative than I am now. Um, and generally it's funny because I know a lot of people that switches, um, but you know, like I was, uh, you know, started teenage Republicans, you know, at my high school and everything else. And, and I started to study religion and that's actually what made me actually become a little bit more liberal, uh, and so forth. So it just is kind of like it changed, it changed me for going more liberal where if people started studying religion, they end up becoming more conservative. Right. Um, so I don't know. That's how it worked for me. You were like Alex P. Keaton of Family Ties. Remember that uh, yeah, show? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. I mean, it's funny because when I was younger, uh, see, you know, it might sound like I had a silver spoon lodged up my derriere having a family, I had an amusement park, but it was completely, you know, opposite of that. Um, you know, my family was actually pretty poor. Uh, my mom went to, uh, decided to go to seminary when I was in uh, uh, elementary school. And so we literally worked to get my mom through school where, you know, clean real estate office at night. Uh, my dad was in and out of work all the time. Um, and so we literally, like our allowance was what we could save in coupons. You know, so I learned how to be very frugal, very young. And um, even though like my, my rest of my family was living a very large life, we were worried day to day. Uh, and that always had a sensibility to me too. But the funny thing, the reason I bring that up is when I was a teenager, I was a hardcore punker. You know, I used to go to all these shows in New York and stuff. I used to tag with a bunch of people in New York and in Bronx and so forth. And the reason that I was a punker is because I couldn't afford what my peers were wearing. So I go to thrift stores. You know, so I had to separate myself. I had to be different. You know, and it's it, it's sad if you think about it that way. But it was kind of like my defense mechanism, and and that's kind of like why you know that was. But as I grew a little bit older, I then became a bit more conservative, and then the. Alex P. Keating kind of garb started to uh, to uh, rear its head. Being at the amusement park, watching your grandfather work, can you talk about how that shaped your business background and then share some of the early lessons you learned? If you think about it this way, at an amusement park, you have an amusement, right? You have either it's a ride or it's entertainment. And around that you have some sort of, all, you have three different profit centers generally. You have merchandise, games of chance, food. And so early on, I learned this concept of what you know people call transmedia. I call it a sin experience, and I'll tell you why in a second. But like I learned, like this has always been in my DNA, like how to create, like basically how to build out story worlds. Um, and so um, you know, if you go to an amusement park and they do it well, they'll create different sorts of experiences throughout the park. You know, like for instance, you go to Disney World, you have like you know Frontierland. Um, you know, you'll have like different sorts of things in it. But if you're in Frontierland, you're going to eat barbecue. Everybody's dressed in Western gear and it looks that way. So I started to develop my, my um, film properties pretty much the same way that I was going to build out a story world, just not a linear storyline where people could be entertained with different facets of the, of the, uh, of the content. Uh, so people can jump in, jump out of the storyline and everything else. Um, but it was interesting though, is um, as a kid, I started to realize certain business things um, where I was outside of an office one day and I heard my two uncles debating about who was going to get the syrup contract between Coke and Pepsi. And so I'm like, hmm, that's interesting because they're exactly the same price, right? It all came down to how much free stuff that we were going to get. And so, and that's literally what the deciding factor was, is how much free merch they were going to get. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And so from day one of my filmmaking career, I've always had product placement in all my films. And it's been something that it's, one is I feel like it uh, makes the story that much more authentic because you're using real product. But then number two is you get a bunch of free stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and then with Billboard, we ended up even, them even giving us money for things too. So living in an, you know, living, you know, as a family had an amusement park, it gave me a completely different sensibility than a lot of my peers have. What did watching your grandfather's business teach you about sponsorship? Um, okay, it's, it, it's interesting because my grandfather um, helped build it, but then it was his, his brothers and sisters that ran it. Uh, so it was interesting because my grandfather was pushed out of his will because my grandfather wanted to raise his kids instead of being raised in the park. So he was completely ostracized from the park. Um, early on. Aww. So we had to work it and everything because it was the family tradition, uh, but my grandfather never got any of the riches from it whatsoever. He got, when his, when his father passed away, he got 500 bucks. 
And you know, that's, that's the way it is. That's what it was. So I just wanted to make sure that you realize it wasn't my grandfather. It was actually sure. my uncles and aunts that were running it. Okay. Um, but um, uh, it, it taught me a lot. It taught me a matter of one is taking care of people is very important. Uh, realizing that you know, it is a business, even though we're in show. Uh, it makes you realize that you know all the hard work that goes into it. You know the park opens at you know twelve o'clock. We're there at eight. The park closes at uh, you know at ten o'clock. We're there till two. You know, so it's just a matter of like so long hours. <laughs> we're par for the course. Um, but it's also interesting too is like how much ingenuity took place, uh, and also it's a matter of um, like my great grandfather ended up having a bunch of patents on on um, on uh, different sorts of concession things. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, um, but also too, is like you had to change with the times. And it's interesting because in the film industry, people are so afraid to change where, and I'm a very early adopter of a lot of stuff. That's why I've always been. Uh, and in the entertainment or in the amusement business, you have to be the same way. You have to constantly be fresh. You have to be new. You can't be boring or else people are gonna come year after year. You can't have the same old rides. You have to do something different. You know, new spectacles. When you saw that he put in all this hard work and then in the end, maybe it didn't turn out exactly the way he had planned or, or maybe it wasn't that important to him. Did it teach you a lot about putting sort of all your energy and hope into something and maybe it'll work out and maybe it wouldn't and being still able to take that risk? Kind of being free of like whatever the outcome is? Um, we were are born risk takers. We're also, um, we work very hard and we will persevere. Like it's almost like there's a line of stubbornness <laughs> that you'll keep working and reworking and, and, and doing whatever you can to make it work. Um, and you know, sometimes you have to pivot uh, in a different direction to make it work. Um, but it's just a matter of if you are honest, you work hard um, and you have a vision, you basically do whatever you can to make that, that vision happen. Like my grandfather, um, because he was ostracized from his own family, started a kitty land at an airport, you know, the Allentown Airport. And it was interesting because people still talk about it. And my grandfather literally built all the rides himself. Uh, he built all the concession stands himself. And it was open from May until September. And my mom and all of her sisters had to work it and things. So it's kind of interesting, like it's in our blood, it's in our DNA to kind of like do this sort of thing and to persevere and to do what you had to do to, to make it. Um, but it's a matter of like, you know, like he was, you know, kind of like shunned from his own family, which is pretty sad. So. I think we already talked about this, but I'll just, okay. How many revenue streams does an amusement park have? Gosh, uh, well, you have, first of all, you have admission, right? And then you, know, you generally will have um, your amusement, whether it be a ride or an entertainment. Like, let's say it's like a, like a song and dance routine or something like that. Uh, but then you have merchandise, you have your games of chance, and you have food. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is, is um, Dorney Park was founded as, um, it was a catering company first. Uh, my family moved over here from France in the 1800s, they were all butchers, and to sell more food, they brought in a carousel, <laughs> and that's how the whole park started. Was literally started out as, as, as a food operation, and to sell more food, they built amusements. And my great-grandfather came very friendly with Walt Disney, because uh, their boats were right next door to each other in Fort Lauderdale in Florida. And, um, and when, when Disney was building you know, Disney World in Orlando, um, it, was, um, it was interesting because you know, Disney had a completely different view on what he was doing versus what my grandfather was doing. Disney was a dreamer. My grandfather was a moneymaker. Uh, and and his, his sole purpose was really to entertain. But as you entertain people, people forget about what they're spending and they spend more money. Oh, that's a great point. You know, and it's kind of, it's, it's, it's like one of those things. And, and so um, I'm not saying that every amusement park is built the way that my grandfather, my great grandfather built his, but that's, that, that was like literally the DNA of it. So it wasn't originally supposed to be an amusement park. It was to sell more food. So the food was unbelievable. And so then you also understand why he had all these patents on concessions, like, you know, would like ketchup and mustard dispensers that would like basically turn and, and the condiment would flow out. He actually patented the um, waffle iron that flips. Um, all these weird things just to be able to sell more, more food. So when it comes to filmmaking, which would you say you are? The Walt Disney model or your grandfather's? Ooh. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'd say both. 
because it's funny because I write, direct, and produce. Uh, I will produce other people's work, but I'll I will direct what I write um, and end up producing it as well. Um, but um, I am a dreamer as a Disney, and I do create everything from scratch. Um, but at the same time, I'm very practical. Like for instance, with Billboard, we ended up driving revenue very early on to the project. We were cash flow positive before we ever shot any film uh, because we ended up selling Billboard spaces throughout the content. Uh, and so, I mean, mind you, it costs a lot more than just the Billboard spaces. You know, like we, you have, I have a bunch of money wrapped up in it. But so I'm a pragmatist and also a dreamer at the same time. Uh, I think that's what's made me somewhat successful is because I can think both ways. Um, and but at the same time, if I know that I have to make that dream happen, I will work my butt off to make it happen. That makes sense. So. Why get into filmmaking rather than join a family business or start something else? Um, I've been a storyteller since I've been a kid, trying to get myself out of trouble, <laughs> generally. Um, and so I always love telling stories. I've been a writer since I've been little. Um, and then having a lot of um, things happen uh, to me, uh, I would basically express myself through writing. And then I found um, filmmaking to be something that I thoroughly enjoy because it brought a lot of my uh, passions together. Like I love the whole building of sets and things and building the world. Uh, I love the whole costuming part of it. I love, you know, the acting part of it. And, and it's just like, so there's so much about it that I thoroughly enjoy. And when I was younger, I, I actually wanted to be an actor. Uh, and so I did a bunch of acting. I actually was in John Waters' film, Hairspray, as one of the uh, Corny Collins Council members. Um, and, um, and so, uh, but I didn't pursue acting um, too deep. Uh, I got very close to a major role and because I did not get it, it gave me cold feet and I never acted again. Uh, and so I have a lot of respect for actors. Um, I direct actors that I will only let them do what I would do. Uh, and I will never risk my crew members. And so like I will only take, like for instance in Billboard, there's these you know, really crazy winter shots that I went out and shot it myself because I would not risk my crew. That's just the way I am, you know? And so um, filmmaking has always been, it's not been, it's not something that I grew up wanting to do. It's something that I gravitated towards uh, because I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to affect people. Um, I wanted to like inspire them, um, you know, stir emotions and just provoke thought. And that's pretty much why I'm, I'm a filmmaker. So when you were like skateboarding around Allentown or whatever with your mohawk or yeah, it was mohawk. your Sex Pistols <laughs> t-shirt or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, did, did you have any idea of how you wanted your life to be? Did you want to be a musician or you still wanted to be an actor at that time? And um, no, actually, it's funny because even when I was a, when I was a, 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 a punker, I still wanted to basically go to Wall Street. Oh, I, st did, I still yeah. really wanted. Yeah, I love I love business. I really love business. Like I I, um, I go to conferences, um, you know, startup conferences and things. Um, and it's funny because I speak at you know a lot of different colleges, and and I'm doing a pretty intensive thing at Wharton in a couple of weeks. Um, because how I create is very different than my peers, and also how I make money is very different than my peers. And so um, I would say I'm pretty much still a, pretty much a business person, uh, but I have this creative itch that I'm constantly scratching. It's like poison ivy and it's getting all over me. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that, um, that you know, I just love to pursue. You know, but I, I, love tell, I, I love my very first film, Affairs, um, was very mediocre, um, but it um, uh, did very well financially. Uh, and the crazy thing is, it's like, it's like, you know, it got me, you know, on the Sundance uh, radar. Not that it was not at Sundance, but because I produced it and because I made money at it, I was invited to the Sundance Producers Conference. I announced that to my first film. Um, and, um, and so I've kind of held that same sort of uh, um, model, that same sort of, of equation from my early films I still hold today. What was it about? Uh, Ferris was about the, um, was about exactly what it says is affairs it, so and affairs ended up being another film that i ended up doing later on called in search of so it's about the repercussions and consequences of people's sexual actions uh affairs was kind of like um like a, a flirtation of it it was only a 74 minute film uh shot in black and white um and everything kind of like wrapped around that you were finally realized that this was an entire family um that these little vignettes all circled around thanksgiving dinner 
Oh, wow. So yeah, because it came to me after being away from home for a while and going home and realizing I had no clue what my brothers and sisters were doing. <laughs> That's the genesis of the, of the, of the script. It was like, wow, I wonder what they're doing and everything else and stuff. And I, hopefully they weren't doing half the crazy stuff I, I came up with in my mind, but you know, so be it. What were some of the biggest mistakes you made early on in your filmmaking career? Rushing. Um, early on, I would rush through script, I would rush into production, I'd rush through posts so I could share it. Um, that is probably my biggest problem, is that, like for instance, I had this project called AKA that I rushed into production because my dad always wanted to be in a movie and he was dying of cancer. So um, I literally wear my heart on my sleeve with a lot of the things that I do and the reasons for why I do certain things. Um, but um, that was probably my biggest lesson learned. And so now, like I take my time, I believe in story R&D, where I like to make things or break things, test them in front of audiences, uh, and see what's working and what's not working. Um, you know, like for instance, with Billboard, we have a, a web series part of this that we tested in front of a live audience where we staged it you know, as a play. I never staged a play before in my life, but I just did it, what the hell? You know, it was successful, it was crazy. You know, it was an interactive play where the audience interacted with the characters via social media. On one screen above the billboards was um, the information that the billboard sitters were putting out. On another screen was what the audience was putting in and some of the action on the stage was, was uh, improv based off of that correspondence. Uh, I mean, the actors weren't literally tweeting and stuff. We had a whole other team doing all that kind of stuff, but it was just very interesting, very dynamic, and it was an experiment. Uh, but the interesting, what we learned from it was how the audience was reacting to the material that would then become the web series. You know, you think about it, like filmmaking should really take a little bit more of a, of a thought about what TV does in terms of film before a live studio audience, right? So just like what TV does, what do they do? They rehearse it for the first three days, they bring it into a, a, you know, to a live audience, they tape it four times, they change some, some stuff up, if something's not hitting right, and then they, they, final, they finally do the taping. You know, the end taping, or the last two, the last two uh, tapings, I should say. Um, and I think filmmaking should take a little bit of that. Uh, like for instance, with Billboard, we did sneak previews this past fall uh, to test our audience, because uh, we thought we knew who our audience was uh, based off of earlier test screenings, and then also doing A-B testing with uh, Facebook ads and so forth. But we wanted to make sure that was it and making sure that they responded to the material. And so we did a, a bunch of sneak previews to test what the how the audience was reacting to the material, making sure that our test audiences were the actual audience. And in fact, we even, you know, I actually ended up shooting two scenes uh, that end up in the final film. So I firmly believe in story R&D. And so now the lesson learned was not rush, but actually take your time. And also too, is like not having all the resources at your disposal also warrants taking your time as well. Um, the other lesson I learned too was a matter of uh, empowering people to be successful. Uh, teach them all that you can and then hand the objective over to them and, and you know make sure they hit their tasks. Um, and I still have the same sort of uh, you know, organizational stuff that I had from my very first film. I mean, you have to realize like, I learned by doing. Uh, I didn't learn this stuff in school because I had like one semester of film school behind me. So I literally learned by doing. Uh, and so over the course of the years, I, I think I've become a better and better filmmaker. Um, and um, I've lost my arrogance. I don't think filmmakers should be arrogant. I think that they really need to listen to their audience and, and figure out uh, who they're actually appealing to. How did you know you were rushing through your first film and, and the whole process? Like what, was it feedback? Was it an epiphany you had or? Just me watching my own material. You know, I think that filmmakers need to be honest with themselves. Uh, and not everything you make is gonna be great. But at the same time, everything you make should be a testing ground for your next project. We are filmmakers, it's a craft. People have to remember, we, we're, 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 we're craftsmen, crafts ladies, you know? And so it's a matter of, and with film, you bring all these different craftspeople together to be able to create one, one piece of work. Um, and it's one of those things that people don't think about enough. And, and I always talk you know, to a bunch of students and say like, listen, like you'll learn more by doing than you will in school. You know, because you have to do it, you have to fail, you have to figure out what works and doesn't work. But I learned that I was rushing through things by watching stuff myself after the fact. You know, I was, I was um, a bit naive, a bit arrogant, and thinking that, you know, what I would make would make money, and, and thankfully it all has. Um, it's interesting, it's like I have a very different business model, I keep saying that, but um, like all my films have been profitable except for one, it's the only film that we sold. <laughs> you know, it's very strange, you know, because I, I firmly believe in theatrical distribution. Um, you know, I, I believe in, in what I call a $10,000 screening, where you were actually netting $10,000 at a screening. 
Uh, so like, you know, we'll have this, like I'll rent the largest place possible, you know, sell as many tickets as we can. We tier the ticket prices, you know, $10, $35, 125 that's $125. Um, and so we, um, <clears throat> for instance, $10 just gets you in the film, 35 is the film and after party. You know, the 125 is a pre-party screening and after party, and then also like, you know, like swag bag sorts of stuff. Uh, then we f hand out film bills that we sell advertising in. Uh, I literally make all the, then I we have merch and all these sorts of things. So I literally will net at least 10 grand, you know, per screening. Um, and I generally do that in the early, early parts of, of uh, film release. And I've been successful at it. So you, know, you, do, you string a number of those together, you're in the black. Um, and um, you know, so it's like just a model that I've, I've created for myself. And I also have some, I have always have some other sort of IP involved. Like for instance with AKA, I told you about earlier, the film tanked, it didn't do well, but I made more money on a cocktail book that I <laughs> made associated with the project than I did on the film itself. Uh, but I still equate that to the film because it's all part of the same, the same property. Uh, so I always think about like creating different revenue streams for every project. Um, like for instance, with Billboard, you know, we have I created a radio station, uh, WTYT 960. We have the web series. We have now the interactive play, and we have the feature film. And then with all that stuff, we can sell um, you know sponsorships, you know, because we're actually you know showing off brands within the content that we've created, uh, and so that drives a whole other level of of, of income. How many sponsorships do you have for Billboard? Um, four, six, seven, eight. There's nine, nine sponsors. Nine? Okay. Uh, yeah, and 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 I'll be very candid. Uh, they go anywhere from uh, nine thousand up to forty thousand. I see. So that and nine thousand is your minimum entry point. Yeah. And do you know these, <laughs> that's a fantastic. Yeah, did, yeah. Do you, did you have prior business relationships with any of the sponsors or no. you just cold call or? Cold call, but also too, is like I firmly believe that uh, filmmakers need to build audience early on. And so what we did first is we created the radio station, WTYT 960, um, where now there's well over a thousand bands on it from, I think we're in 22 countries, 49 states. Uh, and so I did that was, so I knew that we could, that we had an audience. Uh, and no sponsor is going to give you anything unless you can prove that they're going to have impression counts and unless they know that they're going to have some sort of audience for the project. Um, so not only do we have those thousand bands, but then we have their fans. And we did, we did, a, um, we did an average of them. And each of the bands averaged at least 6,000 fans. So all of a sudden, you know, 1,000 bands and 6,000 fans, you're at, you know, what, 6 million? Uh, reach, you know, which is pretty astronomical for a small independent film. Uh, and so we were able to get those numbers because we could prove that we actually had, you know, impressions. Uh, and so we had audience and that's what's, that's what's pretty fascinating about all that. But because it's not easy to do, um, but we were able to do it. With the film screenings where you said you netted 10 grand? 10 grand. What, uh, what's your split with the theater? Like how are you working? I read them. You rent them, so you buy it out. You, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and okay, yeah. so there's no. So my, yeah, mind you, that's not every screening that we do is ten grand. Oh. Early on, we do, we do. Um, it's interesting because we found that we do better at events when we have events around our projects than we do just like you know running a week or something like that. So we're going to be you know like reformulating that model a little bit and, and taking it on the road. Uh, but like what we do is like we'll, we'll launch the film by that ten thousand dollars screening because then that also too is frees up capital and also builds buzz that we then have a very good box office, uh, and that's how that's how it all how it's all generated. So I've written about this a couple of times. Like I, I wrote uh, something for Ted Hope's blog um, about the ten thousand dollars screening and things, and um, it's very possible every filmmaker could do it. If they really can. Uh, interesting thing is is because I produce and I create outside of so far outside the system of New York and LA, that there's anomalies that happen because of that. Like, I don't know if you could do it in LA, quite honestly, is because there's so many filmmakers making so many films here that I don't know if it would work, nor in New York, but it does work where I'm from. Yeah, that's what I was just gonna ask you. Yeah. So, so it, it, do you have such a leg up because it's a smaller area, they wanna support local artists, they're excited, maybe they're even in the film. Uh, to, yeah, absolutely, to a point, but at the same time, um, it, again, it has its pluses and minuses. Um, you know, it's harder for me to produce in my hometown because of that. Really? Uh, well, because I have to bring in everybody. 
you know, like there, there is colleges that have, um, you know, film programs, but I end up teaching everybody. And then once I teach them, they stick around for a couple of years and then they come to LA, you know, because I, 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 cause I don't produce enough work, you know, fast enough to be able to sustain like full-time people over the course of a long period of time. So we end up bringing in people from New York, Philadelphia, you know, for crew uh, and also some cast. Then we also fly casting from LA. So that's a problem is like when you're producing in places that are more remote, um, they do cost more. People don't think about that. You know, catering, per diem, lodging, uh, transportation. Uh, but then also too is like people be like, oh, well you get, you know, tax incentives and yada, yada, yada. But you only get those if you qualify for them. And so there is a certain thing that you have to be aware of. And again, it comes down to the business side of things. Um, like for instance, I produce off of cash flow. Not many filmmakers do that. Uh, so I don't qualify for a lot of um, tax incentives because I don't have, you know, the $800,000 in the bank you know, after July 1st, after they pass their uh, pass their, their budget, you know, I basically, you know, make money and spend money. That's my business model. And so uh, I don't qualify. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's a matter of um, understanding, like if, if, for instance, like producing outside of like New York and LA and, and uh, Atlanta, um, family members just really need to know what their state tax incentive is before they even, you know, start thinking about budgeting. And also is where they're getting their capital from. Um, you know, there's also different, you know, tricks and everything else that you can do to be able to main, to, to obtain capital. I am horrible at crowdfunding. I have a hard time asking people for money. I think that's one reason why I have very few equity partners in what I do. I generally spend my own money, my wife and my money, quite frankly. Um, like we are um, about 82% of the of the resources that it took to make Billboard. Um, and so, um, but I believe in all in, like I feel like I need to have skin in the game, but I'm so I'm horrible at asking people for money, horrible. I need another producer to ask for money. I can make the money, trust me. I can make the money, it's just a matter of like, I have a hard time asking people for money. Well then there's two probably, maybe you feel freedom too, if you know, okay, well this is also literally my, or our project, you know, if it's your money, if it's 80% your money, there, there's less need to get approval from other people for things. Oh, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot more risk. There's a lot more sleepless nights. You know, I'm worried about making payroll. I'm worried about, like literally, if people watch the film, uh, my, my, my um, you know, the people that work with me have said it's become a bit autobiographical. And it's interesting because we've been screening the film um, with much success, thank God. And, um, you know, some people push back, like, oh, they don't like the ending and things. And I'm like, you know, I understand that. And, and once they, th then they, they'll tend to start arguing with me in a and a which doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so but weird. like, but like, and, and so like, I literally ask them a simple question. Have you ever owned a business? Well, um, I'm like, no, have you ever owned a business? Have you ever had to make payroll? Right. Well, my father did, <laughs> but did you? Well, my father lost his business. I'm like, exactly, exactly. And so the thing is, it's like, it's like people really can't walk the walk unless they've talked the talk, was, did I screw that yeah, around? No, no, so, no, you know, they no. talk the talk unless they've walked the walk. Uh -huh. You know, and so like my wife and I literally, we put everything on the line. It's, 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 it's scary as hell, it's risky as hell, um, but I've made money in the past, so I keep doing it. Um, you know, thank God, you know, like we have been successful. And also too, is like people can't look at filmmaking as uh, a lottery. I have so many friends and so many peers that see getting into Sundance as a lottery ticket that like, you know, they're gonna like have this huge career and everything else and, and, and that sort of thing. I love Sundance, I've had films at Sundance, that's not what I'm saying at all. But it's a matter of people have to look at the long tail of their careers that everything is a building block and you don't wanna be a flash in the pan um, because there's only a few of them. Like you can probably name them on your, on, on your two hands, right? And so how many films have been produced over the past 10 years um, that have gone nowhere, you know? And so people have to think about it more from a business perspective um, and realizing how they can make money at it um, early on. And it's just a matter of um, not looking at it as like, oh my God, I'm gonna make this movie, I'm gonna be rich, but looking at it as I'm making the movie, this is part of my business. You know, like if you make widgets, you might make different widgets over the course of your, of your factory's career, right? If you're a filmmaker, you're gonna make different films over the course of your career. It's not all dependent upon one film. You know, so just think about it that way. It's not, it's not like, and I'm, I'm not saying that I've been hugely successful, you know, but I've made money. 
you know, and I do this full time. You know, and right. and you know, but it, it, it's a grind. I work my butt off still to this day. Um, you know, and I lead by example. I'm the first one in my studio at 7 a.m. and I'm generally the last one to leave at 6:30, 7 o'clock. You know, I've been doing that for 10 years. You know, working on the same project. You know, so it's a matter of vision. It's a matter of 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 just really working. And and yeah, it's six and a half days a week. <laughs> I want to go back to what you said about arrogance, and I'm wondering if that is actually a good trait to have in the beginning, whether you're a filmmaker, entrepreneur, whatever, and then it's good to soften, no? Okay. No, I think, I think arrogance, any, any filmmaker that's arrogant, see there's a misconception between arrogance and confidence. I've never known enough to be arrogant, but I was born confident. I'm still extremely confident in what I do, uh, but I'm not arrogant enough to say that I'm the best thing next to sliced bread. You'll find filmmakers still to this day that walk with an air of arrogance um, that are successful. Um, but at the same time, it's a matter of like, you can kind of see after, after time that that star starts to fade a bit, you know, and that, they're, that people start to understand the real, their real selves. So like I'm saying like a matter of like, when I, when I was talking about arrogance before, is a matter of don't be so arrogant that you lose sight of who your audience is or think that you're better than your audience and that your audience will find you you need to find your audience. It's a completely different sort of idea. You know, so like a matter of like me creating something so esoteric that I didn't have a clear vision, but I pass it off as like this next great thing because of my arrogance and expecting people to be willing to see it is the wrong way of, of looking at your career or looking at the way of, of, of creation. You know what I mean? Like, like it's like, it's like, do you think the Koenig in his abstract impressionism really thought, do you ever thought for a day that he was arrogant? Or was he trying to do something that nobody else was doing in a fit? You know, two totally different things. I think, you know, in terms of, of people rallying around an artist or something like that, yeah, they could air up and they could become arrogant because of their accreditation that other people are giving them. But you can't be arrogant as a sole creator. You know, like you, you can't, you can't like expect people to do something if you, if you haven't risen to that. Does that make sense? You know, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like the whole idea of, of, um, you know, if, if, if people prop you up, yeah, you can become like arrogant. I'm not saying that's warranted by any means, but what I'm saying is a matter of like, don't ever lose sight of your audience or where your base was. You know, like there's been so many filmmakers that have made it and gotten to a higher other echelon, that, but then forgot about, you know, what got them there and what sensibilities their audience found in them early on in their careers. Why do you think you were born confident? Well, I was conceived on the, the day that man landed on the moon. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I know that because my, my biological father um, uh, was a, um, in fashion and so he wasn't around much. Um, and uh, I, my mom just knows that that was the day that I was conceived. Okay. Um, and, uh, but it's interesting that you, that you asked that question is because um, he was a raging alcoholic and beat the living shit out of myself and my mom. And um, I think that's one reason why I've become extremely confident was because of knowing that my mom and I can get through anything together. Um, my mom's still a very big part of my life today. Uh, and it's a matter of when you've been beaten you realize that you have to have inner strength to carry on. And it's just one of those things that it's like, it's like, you know, um, yeah, I'm confident because I know I, I will persevere. I will overcome, you know, and that's just the thing. It's like, it's like, you know, it's funny. I don't mind that I got beat. I really pisses me off that my mom did. You know, and that's the thing. It's like, it's like, it's, I don't know how to explain it. Like even when, you know, I was adopted by my stepfather and that's how I got the name Zeke Zelker and, um, and, uh, and he would become abusive to me, uh, but I was happy that he was taking his, his frustration out on me and not my mom. Um, and, um, and I still to this day, I don't resent it. And really weirdly, I don't resent it because I would have rather taken that beating than my mom have anything. Um, and it's just one of those things that when, when, you, when, when, you know, as a kid, like I was never bullied I was eccentric and everything else because I think one of the people are afraid of me, um, you know, because I never backed down from any com conflict. I just never did. Uh, I think because of that, you know, and it's funny because like that's one reason why I think I can lead 
is I can lead big crews and I know what I want. I know the direction I want to take. I, I've got vision because the whole idea is like when you're cowering in a corner, you have to figure out a way to get the hell out of that corner, you know, and stand back up and, and keep fighting. And so that's kind of like why, you know, I think I've, I, quite honestly, probably those beatings is what, what's, what's gotten to me to where I am today. You think that's why you got into punk rock? Because it's very, um, you know, part of it. No, I got out of that because we were poor. I mean, oh, we, I got out of that because because um, it was um, not necessarily a sign of aggression, but it was literally because we I couldn't afford IZOD. I couldn't <laughs> afford guest jeans. Yeah. And so we would go to thrift stores. I know it sounds crazy, but no, but no, like no. but okay. like also too, I like the aesthetic. I like the kind of like fu attitude. I still do. That's one reason why I cast the cast members that I did because they all have that kind of fu mentality. All you know my four uh, uh, bigger names. Um, but um, I do, I guess I like that music, like even, you know, WTYT is an independent, you know, alternative rock radio station that we created. Um, you know, so I do gravitate towards that, but I wouldn't say that that aggressiveness was because of being beat as a kid. We want to play a video, a recent video. It's with another gentleman who does transmedia or talks about transmedia. And his name is Houston Howard, okay. and he's an author and um, an instructor here at uh, LA Film School. And this video, as of many um, videos with Houston, have, has done incredibly well. So we want to play it. It's got a lot of comments here. So all that to get back to saying, if you're the, the small independent producer that has a low budget, you have to figure out a way to compete. You have to figure out a way to survive, to thrive, to exist in this market. And it's tough to outpunch everybody. You can't overpower Star Wars, you can't overpower Fortnite or, or any of these other things. Now you have to be craftier. Right? So you can't just inundate the world with marketing, with, with posters, with trailers. You can't buy TV spots. So what can you do? And so if you have a good idea, if you have a good story, and you're a great storyteller, now there's all these really interesting tools that we can use to now send your story out and capture the attention of the audience. Right? And so it's not necessarily about putting one fishing lure out there. Now, I'm, now that we have so many tools, we can have 10 or 12 fishing lures out there uh, simultaneously uh, fishing in 12 different ponds all, all the time looking for audience. And, uh, and so what I get though is independent creators saying, one, I don't know how to do it, or even if they know how to do it, they say, uh, that seems like a lot of work, <laughs> right? And that, like that, to me, that is, is such the wrong mindset to have, right? Because we talked about this in the first round of interviews we did, is I always encourage independent filmmakers to be thinking as entrepreneurs rather than just an artist. And because when you're, when you're creating IP, when you're creating, uh, when, when you're launching a film, you're launching a small business. You're, you're setting up an LLC, you're staffing it with a crew, and you're creating something. And you have to think of yourself just like the guy who's opening the coffee shop or the woman that's opening the pizza shop or the family that's opening the candle store down the street. You have to have that same mentality. And so though, like, if you understand the amount of hours and hard work it is to launch your own business, then you, you they, independent filmmakers understand it in, in context of a film. They're fine with spending 18 hours a day on a film set for you know 12 straight days. They, that's fine because that's, they think that's just within the context of what they do. But now it's broadened to where now you have to learn how to, uh, you have to learn how to broaden the scope of that to have, a, uh, have a more, more skill sets at your disposal in order to compete in this crazy market. So as, as a pizza shop owner can't say, well, uh, I love to make pizza, that's my thing. I'm not gonna worry about the bookkeeping because you know, who cares about that? Or I'm not gonna worry about uh, you know, the front of the house. I'm not gonna worry about these other things. All I'm gonna do is make my pizza. The, the business owner, the chef may, but the business owner has to concern themselves with everything. They have to know the full scope of everything and they have to be able to put in the hours and the work to be able to figure that stuff out if they want a successful business. And even, even when they do that, most small businesses fail and, and they fail primarily either because of lack of quality or they don't figure those other things out, right? They, don't, they can't figure out how to compete. And so, so it's such an audacious thing to say, 
you want to be a filmmaker for the rest of your life. This is your dream, and what you wanna do is you wanna live your life professionally making movies for the rest of your life. That is such a first world crazy dream to have, which is an awesome dream. That, that if it's in your heart, 100% go for it. But you have to understand how rare that is and how audacious that is. And the big disconnect with in, especially independent filmmakers is they have this audacious dream of, of how they want to live the rest of their life, just making the movie, like their own movies, and that's their job forever. They have this audacious dream, but at the same time, don't want to go the same audacious route to be able to put in the work to learn all the stuff you need to do to compete to do to make that happen right and what they say to me is they say well tarantino didn't do that right i mean tarantino broke in like you know beyonce doesn't do this or like you know, they, they, they point to they point to these people that one broke in in a different era first of all like like we, we talk about how fast things change now like Things have changed from 2019, like 2015 to 2019, completely different. Let alone when Tarantino broke in in the, the mid 90s, right? Like you, it's not the same world. It's not the same thing. And and the problem that I think people have is they look at Tarantino or they look at Scorsese. They will look at these people. Scorsese doesn't do transmedia. I don't need to do transmedia, right? Wow. Okay. So. Um... Uh, I think he read my blog post about um, independent filmmaking as a startup. I literally paralleled how um, startup companies, uh, how filmmaking is a lot like startup culture, uh, where you've got a bootstrap and everything else. Um, I disagree with the idea of um, Beyonce, because Beyonce busted her butt since she was a kid, uh, working hard at what she was doing. Um, Tarantino had somebody that believed in him and funded him. Um, and also because you're so eccentric, uh, and those eccentricities um, do uh, attract people. Um, and the whole idea of, of transmedia is, I don't, I'm not doing transmedia because of, to try and drop other lures into the pond to fish. I do it because it's innate to my storytelling. Um, I create transmedia, um, projects, which I call scenic experiences, um, because I want to build out story worlds. I want to tell a different part, point of view, a different part of the story in a different way. Um, I do, it's, it's interesting. He, he has a lot of different things that I talk about all the time. Like I think film schools, students in film schools need to take a, a programming class, uh, CS classes, uh, and they also need to take a class in marketing, a class in accounting, and a class in law. Uh, those are all things that I do a lot of, almost on a daily basis. And I think that film schools are, are uh, improperly um, educating their students for what it's really like out there. Um, it's interesting because he also talks about, about building out audiences and doing different things, but I firmly believe that it's actually audience building early on and you take that audience through a series of events, not necessarily like trying to pick out different elements um, and hoping you're gonna find audience. Uh, I wanna take audiences along for a ride. I don't necessarily want them just to be entertained by this little thing and this little thing over there. Um, it's just, I just have a different business model. Um, uh, yeah, I do agree with a lot of things that he's saying, especially from the business standpoint, but in terms of, of I'm not certain I got anything about like transmedia producing though, quite honestly. Okay. Well, he has other videos we could we could. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to follow up on something. Uh, why why uh, coding and why law? Though those of the, I get the marketing part, but why? Oh, I deal with law all the time because you deal with contracts. Everything's contractual. People don't realize you need a clean China title uh, for a film, and people don't probably don't understand what the hell I'm, I'm saying right now, and that's why I need no law, uh, is because if you're selling a property. You need to literally make sure that, the, that, that you have a clear chain of title. When you have a, a film property, it's an IP, just like you have a piece of real estate, right? That's property, property, right? And so you need to basically make sure you have your copyrights in place. You have to make sure that you, know, you, you did a title check. You have to make sure all these sorts of things so you can then, if you, if you end up selling your film to a distributor, you have a clean chain of title. Uh, but law, like, you know, like your contracts, your music contracts, your actor, you know, deal memos like there's so much law i deal with it, it, it's it's insane 
Uh, I mean, I do have attorneys, not to say that I'm the my only attorney. I'm not saying that at all. But then with coding, because we've become such a, um, film and technology are um, merging so quickly that I think there's a lot of opportunity lost if people don't understand what coding is and how it does. Like I can't code myself. When I was younger, I, I knew more coding. Uh, I do understand the concepts, I understand UX, I understand all these sorts of things and I can literally articulate articulate what I want a coder to do and what I want to achieve and I know enough about it to get myself in trouble. Um, but like CS is so important now because um, you have stories that can be told through apps. You know, it's another device you can use as a storytelling tool. Um, and that's kind of like why I say, you know, CS. <clears throat> I think when he was talking about Tarantino and Beyonce, I guess he was trying to say, uh, and maybe it's the point of where we started the video, that, that most filmmakers already think, some, some filmmakers think right out of the gate that they are at that level. That's the arrogance. Okay, so yeah, I think that's, it's, it's, he, he was trying to say that mo people aren't that yet, if, if we've played it further. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so just, uh, just as a, a caveat or whatever, but, um, so I think that, that going back, you're right, everyone thinks that, well, my esoteric idea is, is, is just totally different and they're going to come to me. I don't need to go to them kind of thing. And so No, I, 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 it's funny because I, 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 I agree with him with that. It's, it's, it's a matter of um, you, you have to look at this as, as a business. You know, each, one of your, each one of your films is a new business. Like, and the one thing is, is like, I don't necessarily sell my films. Uh, I license them, but I don't sell them, so I still own all the rights to all my projects. You've never sold one. I of sold. Films? We sold one. It's the only film we didn't make money on. So you sold it to a distributor. Did you do sort of due diligence? Did you research the distributor, make sure the other producers went against what I wanted? Oh, uh. <laughs> straight up, and and so forth, and 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 um, and um, it just is what it is. It's I don't know how else to explain it. Sure. You know, just a business decision that they made. They had more more you know skin in the game than I did. Um, but um, but yeah, it's just one of those things. So like I look at it as a long game, just like how these different sorts of distributors own all this content, and that's what gives them uh, wealth or value. It's the same sort of thing with iDream Machine. It's like we own a bunch of content that eventually I could sell off if I wanted to, you know. But I retain all the rights to all my stuff. You learned from that initial experience, even though you didn't have the, the stake in the decision that no more distribution deals. You'll license it but you're gonna ultimately own it. Was that the final sort of verdict? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's um, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I've never been short-sighted, I guess. I've always looked at it as, as, as a long view. Have I wished that like I've made millions of dollars on my projects? Absolutely. Um, but at the same time, I still have a career and I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, you know, so there's something that I'm doing right, but I got to tell you, it's all because of the business acumen that I have. Uh, it's also my creative too. I'm, I, I shouldn't discount my creative because I do do, do some crazy stuff. Um, and, um, you know, and I'm, you know, a natural born promoter, I think, you know, as well. Um, but it's interesting because I, the, the reason that I got really deeper into transmedia was because I realized that the audiences were fragmenting, meaning that for me to reach an audience, I couldn't just tell, have a feature film that went into theaters. I had to create stories that people could also view on their mobile devices. I wanted to create a way that people could use the different screens and I wanted to tell a different part of the story on each of those screens. Um, you know, when I was releasing In Search of, the entire industry fell apart. You know, all the distributors went to hell, you know, the stock market crashed, everything else. And, and so, like, I had to kind of pick up the pieces um, and it was a very expensive film to make. Uh, in search of was and um, and so I had to figure out how I was gonna make money and that's why I was an early adopter to all these all these um, digital platforms and, and so forth um, but um, you know so I came to transmedia one is I've been doing it I think all my life and the term never was coined uh, Henry Jenkins at MIT was a person that coined uh, the term transmedia um, and um, and uh, but I'm just, as I said I'm getting away from that term I'm calling it a cine experience because I also do live events and everything else around it as well which also generates more capital you know so for instance what we're doing is with the um, WTY 960 the radio station that we created for the con uh, for the for the project is we then hold live events with the bands you know so we obviously charge admission we pay the bands you know we have a, a, we have a great time so but that's yet another revenue stream that we've created what do you think people get wrong about transmedia 
What do most filmmakers fail at? Uh, well, I got to tell you, um, I debate some very big people in the transmedia space, and they are arms of marketing. They're generally brought in after the fact, after the property's been made to actually help market the film, where the way that I do it, it's built into the story DNA early on. And it's interesting because I've had ad agencies that have come to me to uh, create transmedia elements around a given property, uh, and I can do it pretty quickly, just because, again, my family background, I can't, I, 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 can't, I can't escape that because I just was raised a different way, that this is built into my vision, this is built into like how I create. You know, in all my films, I've done this, and, and, and it's just really weird that, that, um, that um, and I know it works and doesn't work. The biggest thing is like you can't create a lot of friction for your audience. A lot of transmedia um, producers, they want to do this, they want to do that. No, wouldn't this be cool? Oh, we should do that. The problem is, is the more friction that you create for your audience, the less audience you're going to have. You know, so you have to kind of of, of be open uh, and also um, lessen the suspension of belief. The more real you can make something, the easier it is for your audience to actually believe in it and want to participate in 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 all the content. For instance, if you do a like a sci-fi um, project, transmedia project, you have to suspend belief before you even start to play with the elements of the creation, right? Because it's sci-fi, it's not real, right? And so, um, so you have to suspend belief, and then all of a sudden you put these hurdles in place that you, people have to go to X, Y, and Z, and then do this and do that to be able to, um, you know, get the content. You're asking a lot of your audience. And I know for a fact, because we I've done this, I've, 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 we have case studies behind it and things, that you have to create the least amount of friction possible for your audience uh, for them to buy into it. Like people, when they go to our shows, don't realize they're stepping into my, into my film world. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but they still don't you know, get it until they're there for a bit. So sorry, let me see if I understand friction. So friction would be where there's like sort of too many things going on in terms of uh, uh, diverting attention so that you could create another story? Not, or, not necessarily just that, but it could be just something that you have in your website that you want someone to view something and then they have to answer four questions to be able to unlock a mystery code to be able to, to then you know, access a QR code that then brings you to a mobile app that brings you back to a Microsoft. It's like, you understand what I'm saying? Like okay. all these crazy things for people to do. Yeah, it's fun, it's a puzzle. You know, we can do some stuff with AR, do the same sort of idea. But I think you have to simplify it for the audience because this is new for people. That's a big thing. And so the thing is, it's like, it's like um, but people have to be willing to, um, you have to make content so compelling that they want to see the other parts of it though too, you know, to be successful. So like with Billboard, people are seeing the film and then they are downloading the web series. Um, you know, again, listen to my audience, is like we originally had 28 episodes of the web series that range anywhere from 90 seconds to seven minutes, realized that the UX um, was cumbersome for um, the viewers, UX meaning um, user interface, uh, was too cumbersome for the viewers that I had to listen to them and I, and I collapsed them down and made nine longer ones. You know, again, it's, not, it's me not being arrogant because of I had to listen to my audience. I'm confident in my content and I'm not afraid to do that because I can do it. But at the same time, it's a matter of like, I realized that I created friction for my audience to be able to uh, enjoy that content that we've created. Why do you think most filmmakers fail in the entrepreneurial mindset? They don't think about business. You know, it's, it's a matter of like, I don't think enough filmmakers come from a business background or, I'm not saying that they should come from business backgrounds, but they should know about business. Or at least have one or two people on their team that are business people. Um, and um, it's crucial, you know. Um, you know my, my wife's a hell of a businesswoman, and, and, you know, and she keeps me in check as well. Uh, and so you need those sorts of things. But I think that not enough filmmakers look at it, again, like it goes back to the lottery system. Like people think they're gonna be Tarantino, or they're gonna think they're gonna be, you know, Scorsese. Scorsese put his, put his time in. Scorsese worked his butt off, you know, and, and, and everything else. And, and I, you know, give him mad props, you know, cause he's constantly making new material. He's constantly changing, you know, just like a, just like a musician would. He has like these different sorts of styles that he's you know, played with and, and everything else. Um, but I just think that, you know, filmmakers need to think about the long game and not the short game. Uh, that, you know, they have to realize that, you know, that it's going to take work. It's going to take a lot of work. 
you know, and that's the thing. It's like if you're not willing to put in the work, then you might want to choose a different path. Well, you've been working on Billboard now for ten years full time. So, what month in two thousand nine? Do you remember that you started? I announced in October. Oh, okay, okay. Of twenty, yeah, two thousand nine. When you first started, when you announced in, in October 2009, did you think it would take you this long? No. What, what time frame did you think? Uh, I thought it was going to take me probably four years. Um, and how I created this whole thing was um, I had this idea for the film and um, I was working on a script uh, and it's completely different than what it is now. And realizing where what happened to In Search Of, um, I unraveled a roll of craft paper, had a black Sharpie in my hand and mapped out the entire billboard project. I still have that piece of craft paper. And it's pretty fascinating because how I wanted to create like the website for the, you know, the radio station and like how uh, bands are going to submit their music and like how we we're gonna aggregate their social media to build our profiles and how the playlist was gonna be formulated and all these sorts of things. And then you know, dealing with the web series and how I was gonna shoot that versus the film. And the only thing that came that we did additional to that original um, ideation session was the, uh, the interactive play. Uh, that was born out of us doing a test of something and I'm like, oh my God, I can stage this. And so we did. Uh, but I thought that it was gonna take me about four years uh, but I didn't realize that I'd have to educate as many people as I did about um, transmedia. Um, and it was just hard to raise money, really hard to raise money. And so like, you know, the only th two things, you could throw money on a problem if you have a lot of it and not take your time and collapse the window, or you could take a lot of time if you don't have the money and make it happen. You know, so I, I obviously opted for the latter, but it's just a matter of, um, of uh, you know, just seeing it through. And also too, is like, I'm glad because, you know, we shot the film over the course of nine months because I wanted seasons to change. Um, and we were shooting the film, uh, it was during the presidential elections. And so, and we're doing this, it was originally, turned, it was supposed to be a comedy. And when we got into post-production, it just was too heavy. It just felt fat. I don't know how else to explain it. Like, just felt uncomfortable. And so we kept pairing it back, pairing it back, pairing it back, then I'm like realizing, okay, I gotta change this thing. And so 40% of the film was shot with three people. Uh, myself, um, uh, Reed Baum, who was my editor and also camera, and then um, uh, uh, Ryan Walsh, who is a producer, but then also ran sound. And so we literally shot 40% of the films, the three of us. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, but I'm glad that it took us time because it let us um, experiment with some things and figure some stuff out um, and we got some great shots. We got the winter stuff and everything else because of it. The first year you began, uh, so like let's say October 2009 to October 2010, what were you focusing on? And, and building, you're, building the radio station. And you're in a recession too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, we, so again, going back to the whole coding side of it was a matter of we created um, WTYT 960 um, from scratch. You know, and so I knew what I wanted to do and how, and, and but I needed somebody who knew how to do it. I never met her in person, but I have a programmer out of Chicago um, that works with me still, she's still working with me. She's been working with, with me from the very beginning of this oh, thing. Wow. And, um, but, and we had a, one uh, programmer in Australia and another one in Czech Republic, because I didn't want to have one person have my IP. Um, and so, um, you know, and she cobbled this thing together, uh, but it's very complex. Like programmers that see it and then they realize like what we did, they're like, wow, okay, this is, this is like a complete build, you know, and we did. And so we, we, you know, and the interesting thing is, is like over the course of time when the social media um, outlets change their APIs, we had to do a whole new build. You know, so time kind of screwed us with that though too, is because it would have been a little bit easier if, if we would have done it in a collapsed amount of time. What, I'm sorry, why would you not want one person to have your IP? Because I could steal it. So having- Well, I was doing it for something completely proprietary. That's the thing, it's like, so, so we, ha we have stuff on that, on the back end, and we built stuff. Um, we built new things, new widgets for WordPress uh, and so forth. So it's a matter of like, we, I did not want people to, to have it, <laughs> quite, quite frankly. You know, so that's kind of like why I had a, I had a team of uh, people that worked on it. 
So, so you had them working on different parts, so they yeah, wouldn't and have then, a and whole. Them together. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So they wouldn't like. Next thing you know, you don't hear from them again. Right and now, someone's doing the same thing. Right. Gotcha. Wow, that's smart. Okay. Yeah. And where did you? Who who advised you on that? That's really. That's, I just did it. You just did it. You just knew like. Well, I just knew like again, knowing the law side of things and realizing that if one person had my IP, the 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 possibility of theft was a lot greater. Um, you know, and so that's that's why you know straight up. I mean, it just is and. And so, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time developing that, and then I also created other ways for, you know, other people to get involved with the project, too. Um, but it's always been like this kind of, um, that's why tech is so heavy in what I'm doing. You can't, producing in the transmedia world, you can't have the absence of technology. Technology, everything rides in the backbone of technology. So you created, you made new widgets for Chris WordPress. Did, yeah, yeah. And and are these now used for? And anybody can insert them into their site. <laughs> no, 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 oh, no, no. So it's open source, but but Chris has Chris has Chris has. I them. see. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the hardest part of the ten years? Raising money. We never we never were capitalized. Never. We still aren't. Honestly, you know. Um, and so like we've just been you know, um, scrappy. We've been bootstrapping the entire time using, you know, uh, a startup mentality, you know. Um, and honestly, like if we had, you know, more capital, things would have been a lot different. And quite honestly, would probably make more money. Um, but it's just a matter of the nature of the beast and and how I wanted to, to do this. You know, because I believe in myself, you know, my in my family believes in what I'm doing too. And so, you know, we're willing to, you know, take those risks. Um, but um, that's, that's probably the hardest thing was definitely the lack of funding. And I know every filmmaker has that, you know, without a doubt. Um, you know, uh, and we produced a big project, a big project. You know, that's the thing. It's like, it's, like it, it's pretty enormous what we've done. Like we built a freaking billboard on the side of a major highway. You know, like enough lumber to build a small house. You know, and so you have to raise all the gear up and everything else. And like just from a production standpoint, it was, it was a huge, huge undertaking. How many different revenue streams did you create with Billboard? And all the oh, content. Oh, think, okay, merchandise, the web series, the radio station, live events, the film, sponsorship. Six. Okay. Which one was the most difficult to make it work? None. 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 Okay. No, not really. No. I mean, I mean, you know, like. Like, because we're still we're still in release, you know. Like, we're still getting things out there. And the thing is, too, it's a matter of there's no there's no like rhyme or reason anymore. There's no rules. You know, it's interesting because there's still gatekeepers, a lot of gatekeepers. Um, like, we're having a hell of a time booking theaters, uh, even though we've made money. Um, you know, there's gatekeepers at 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 film festivals. Not to say that I want to get into film festivals. Um, uh, there's gatekeepers every step of the way, and you just have to figure out a way to get around them. You know, just like when we used to tag, you know, subways in New York, you know, we still got away from them <laughs> or around them. You know, they will be able to do these sorts of things, but it's just, a, it's like, it's like, you know, um, uh, but you're, there's gatekeepers. That's probably the biggest challenge um, for indie filmmakers right now. But in terms of the different sorts of revenue streams, like we're still, we're still in it. We're still making money, you know? So it's like, it's like, and then we're just started. It, like, we're just getting this thing out there now. Like people are just starting to find out about it. Yeah, you know, so which is kind of exciting. So you know, we've made money in sponsorship. We've made money in merch. You know, um, you know, we've made money. You know, at events. Like, yeah. So it's it's working. It's funny because you said the gatekeepers, and there's like two catchphrases with any film, and that is the gatekeepers are no longer in control, and you have to build your audience. And that's really interesting that you say that the gatekeepers still they still exist. Oh, absolutely, they do. Can you, can you challenge that a little bit? Oh, uh, yeah, about sure. That? So. Um, Oh God, where do I start? Um, with film festivals, for instance, um, there's gatekeepers, and realize too, it's like, you know, everybody wants to get into the big film festivals, um, and the thing is, is people have to realize that they program a certain way every year, and that that programming changes, and so what might have gotten into Festival X in 2015 is not going to get into Festival X in 2016. Um, and that's the thing, so the sensibilities change. So those are gatekeepers that you are unaware of how things change, right? Um, and so, um, and there's a lot of um, backroom politicking going on, 
a lot of it. And I'm so far outside the system that I don't even play in the pol uh, the politics. I don't know them. You know, uh, it's there's gatekeepers in press. There's gatekeepers of trying to get press. There's there's gatekeepers in terms of trying to get reviews. Um, you know, unless you're worthy or something along those lines, will you get reviewed by like a major outlet? Um, you know, then the theaters have gatekeepers. Like, you know, if you own a theater, they then have a booker that they put as, as, as a diversion, you know, and, and so like, okay, you gotta appeal to the booker. Okay, the booker likes, then you have to appeal to the, to, to the theater. Um, and so um, there's all these, I mean, imagine they're all business people, right? So they're all business people trying to do the best they can for their own individual businesses. Um, and people like us creatives look at them as like, you know, gatekeepers, right? Uh, but just a matter of having sensibility, and, is, and if you can plead your case and, and understand what you are selling, um, that's a big leg up. And actually not necessarily under, let them know what you are doing, but what you can do for them. You know, the big thing is, it's like, it's like, you know, when, you know, I now go to like film festivals, I often end up, you know, having some sort of talk back or some sort of educational thing because people are intrigued of like how I do what I do. Um, and, you know, that's a selling point for me. You know, uh, that, that separates me from my peers. Um, you know, in terms of uh, film festivals, um, it all depends on what they're programming and it's really hard. But again, it's, it, it, they're, there's gatekeepers. I, I don't know how else to explain it. And, and it's also too, it's like, I'm not coming down at critics by any means because uh, the industry needs them. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is because so many budgets have been cut from media outlets that is fewer and fewer. And so they can only cover so many things. But people like me get frustrated by that, and that we don't—that doesn't come to mind right away. Uh, and you wonder why the hell they aren't like looking at my, you know, my piece, you know, or they're not understanding it, um, you know. And 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 there's some really like awesome reviewers out there. I'm not saying that there's not, but at the same time, it's a matter of like somebody that's small, that's a first time out. It's going to be very hard to get, you know, recognition, and which is which is a shame. It's really interesting, yeah, that you say that, that, that the gatekeeping still exists even in this realm. I think so many people think, oh, independent filmmaking, you can be outside the system, you can do whatever you want, but no, I mean... How, how, how are you going to make money? You, you can try to do whatever the hell you want, but how are you going to make money? Honestly, I mean, it comes down to it. If, if you can't book a theater, um, you're not going to make... Well, I get it if, if you want to go into theaters, I mean, because there's so many different business models. I think that's probably what they're saying. There's no more gatekeeper, gatekeepers because there's all these different business models. But when, when push comes to shove, you still have to make money. Uh, and so you have to figure out how to facilitate that. Like right now, we're having a hell of a time trying to get press, straight up. Uh -huh. You know, and, and even though I'm doing stuff different, even though I've got an interesting story to tell, um, and um, it's just a matter of, um, you know, maybe I'm, I'm too assertive, I don't know. Um, but it's just a matter of like one of those things. It's just, it's been a challenge, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know what to say. Maybe I'm not press worthy, I don't know. Well, no, <laughs> just be that. It's no film school covered you, which is, I would say that that's an acclaim right there. Great, great site, so. No, I'll be honest, I wrote the article. Ah, okay, okay. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give it to you straight. But still, but, but they allowed you to have it there. Which right, is absolutely, a, yeah. That, yeah, that's yeah, an yeah. there's another piece that I wrote too that's gonna be published by a major outlet as well. Okay. But the weird thing about it is like, it's like I'm the one writing about what I'm doing, they're not having somebody cover it. So yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, so, so like, because I have written before and I've been published before and yada, 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 so like, I guess that does mean something. Um, but I've, I've got to be honest with people. Like, yeah, I'm not going to say like, oh yeah, they covered me, isn't that great? I covered me. Hmm. They were just the outlet. And, and, and again, it's like, it's like you know, anybody can reach out to me and I'll give it to you straight. You know, and, and that's a thing. It's a matter of, of yes, it's an honor and, and, and I appreciate them for doing it. I really do. Because uh, we wouldn't have gotten it otherwise, um, you know, and um, uh, but it's just it's just true. I don't I don't know what to say. It's it's the truth of the matter. Well, I think it's good that people hear that even if you're quote independent, it, it's not it's not as independent as no. as one would think. So no, and 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 it's like it's like you know every you know yeah the thing about it too. It's like how are these critics or these or these publications making money, right? You know they're selling advertising. Uh, and so they only can sell so much advertising that they have so much readership. And so that's one reason why too is I think a lot of the um, normal indie outlets are going more and more mainstream 
uh, because they need to appeal to the widest audience possible so they can then have the readership so they can charge more money for their ads. It, you have to go where the money goes. I, I don't know how else to, to say it. You know, it, it's, uh, and everybody has their own business models and I understand that. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that, you know, I had, you know, there was, a, I saw a couple films of Slam Dance this past year that were just outstanding films that probably are never gonna see the light of day, um. which is so sad. You know, because the filmmakers busted their butts getting them there. Um, you know, I liked them. I could find them a market, quite honestly. I could distribute their films for them. I know I could and make money for them. Um, but I don't, I'm still vacillating whether or not I want to go into that business. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's like, because knowing all the, all the other BS I've got to go through to be able to make them successful. Do you think the politics exists because you're not in Los Angeles or do you don't think that has anything to do no, with it? No, it does. Absolutely it does, yeah, because um, um, it's so funny because when I go to film festivals, people from New York think I'm from LA, people from LA think I'm from New York, and then when I say I'm from Allentown, PA, they're like, what the hell are you doing in Allentown? <laughs> and then I tell them, you know, my family, you know, I tell them the history of it, and like, oh, you're the guy from Allentown then, you know, so it does differentiate me from the pack, and also too is my projects are so um, authentic because I don't listen to stuff going on around me because there isn't any. You know what I mean? There's not many filmmakers in Allentown. Um, and so, but at the same time, I'm not, you know, going out to cocktail parties or things to know what's going on. You know, down the street right now, we're in LA. It's like, you know what I mean? So it's like, and so I'm so removed and that is a problem because I, I, I can't rub elbows with people. And, and that's my own problem. That's my own fault. It's my own challenge. It's a matter of like, I need to be present more. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if more people knew what I was doing and I was more positioned, I guess you would say, uh, I could be more successful. Um, but it just is the nature of the beast. You said earlier that, you know, you need to be more present and maybe not being in LA hurts you. I'm wondering if there's actually advantages to you being in Allentown because you're around like a smaller pool of people who might be more Supportive, not that people aren't supportive in LA, but there's so many projects. There's so many people hitting you up on a daily basis. Come see my band, come see this. So. Um, well, it, it, it's interesting is because um, being in Allentown, um, I end up doing a lot of teaching of crew, um, a lot of um, hand holding and things. And so it's interesting is because now we're in, L I'm in LA, you know, promoting my film. And, um, Two people I'm going to be seeing are people that work for me, you know, here that are very successful here now, you know, and because like I, 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 I teach them by doing, I'm not going to let them fail. I will take the responsibility if they fail, right? When they're working with me, you know, that's how I, that's how I manage. I'm going to give you the education. I'm going to give you the, I'm going to empower you to do your job. If you fail, that's on me. It's not on you because I didn't instruct you properly. So I let the, I give them a lot of free reign, and at the same time, I teach them a lot of different things, like how to read a contract, how to do the whole research that they didn't learn in film school. But then, the, but then the problem is, is, is it takes so long for me to produce my next project that that they have to find other work. So they come to LA and then they're successful. So it's interesting. It's a matter of like, um, you know, so living in in Allentown, yeah, it's it, like I don't have to ask for permission to do a lot of things. You know, I don't need to have like all these, I mean, mind you, I get all my location secured and everything else, but there's not the hassle I think you have to do in LA and New York. Um, and also people are willing to do things like we had these crazy helicopter shots and billboard because I have a friend that owns a helicopter. So we did these beautiful aerial shots. You know, so it's like, yeah, we can do that. So I don't know how the hell you do it in New York or here, quite honestly. You know, you probably have to do X, Y, and Z and jump through this, this, this union and that union, like, you know, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like, so, you know, producing in, in a town like Allentown is great because of that. And it's also beautiful to shoot it because there's so many different varying um, scenes and, you know, scenic things and everything else. But it has its challenges. You know, that's the thing. It's like people have to realize when they're shooting on location, you have a lot of location expenses. Can you take us through the sponsorship process? I'm sure each one was different. You said you had six sponsors? No, six revenue streams. We have, I think, at least nine sponsors. That's right, I'm sorry, my bad. Um, okay, so sponsorship is different than product placement, okay? Product placement, you basically, you know, you wanna have company X in your film, um, and so you have to clear it uh, to be able to, to have that 
that their IP, their trademark, their logo in your in your film. Um, and so, but if you're good at it, you could get a lot of free stuff out of it. Uh, I've had I've had directors that I've worked with in the past like challenge me like, can you get me this? Can you get me that? And and generally, oftentimes I can get them crazy stuff. Um, and um, but it's a matter of knowing how to do it. Um, and you have to know what you're asking for. Um, and you need to give them a reason why you're asking for it. And you need to make sure you have your contracts buttoned up and everything else as well. Uh, now in terms of sponsorship, it's a matter of making sure that they know that there's gonna be an audience for your project. And so that's one reason why you build audience early on. Um, and with that being said, you have to make the sponsor as comfortable with the project as possible and be very transparent about what you're doing. Um, you know, brands will not, do not like when you bash their brand. Obviously, that's not going to even work. I mean, we've even had um, brands say that they have to be their protagonist, not the antagonist. Wow. You know, and so like it gets to be a little bit, a little bit tricky on certain things. Um, but the sponsorship process is, you know, creating a deck, um, you knowing where and how their um, identity is going to be seen, um, what their activations are going to be above and beyond just the picture itself. In terms of, are there going to be live events? Is there going to be premieres? Is there going to be, you know, um, you know, anywhere where they could, you know, attach themselves to? Uh, you have to provide these all this like kind of like packages for the sponsors. Um, and so it's work, it's a lot of work to be able to, to get it. Uh, but we were able to raise, um, oh gosh, uh, about 20% of our budget came from sponsorship. Wow, oh my goodness. And how are you choosing which sponsors to approach? Research um, and um, what I want. I guess you would say, like, 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 literally, like, in, in for Billboard, I first went to local businesses uh, because we wanted to feel authentic, um, and so it only made sense for us to show off local businesses. And then after that, we green screen the billboards in the in the film, so we can actually change out them all. If we go to like India, we could change out the billboards to Hindi, you know, French, the same sort of thing. Um, and again, just think about like an entrepreneur, think about like, like a business person. And, um, but um, we did that so that the brands could then see the content so they would okay it. You know what I mean? So, so that's kind of like another reason why too, is to try and mitigate as much risk as possible. So you find some brands that you think would be a good fit and then you're calling them, you're sending an email? I always call first. Um, and it's a matter of, the, then it's tracking down the right person you need to be speaking to because every company is different. You know, some of them it's a brand manager, some of them is a, C, is a CMO, some of them is the, um, uh, uh, they have a sponsorship coordinator, some of them are, you know, they're movie development people. Like for instance, some companies use an outs a third party, um, like I think it's tier three and like a bunch of other ones that they use as a clearinghouse for things so that you then have to talk to them. It's a lot of legwork, a lot, a lot of legwork. Uh, but I've been doing it for so many years that like I, like <laughs> there's one gentleman uh, that was at Lafayette College at a, he was a junior in college and wanted to intern for me over the summer. And I'm like, this is what you're gonna be doing. And he's like, how am I gonna do that? I'm like, I'm gonna teach you. I'll tell you what you need to do. And he would come back with me with law questions all the time and everything else. And um, by the end of the summer, like he could be hired by any major studio, Cause, because it's you're scrappy. Once you've already established who the brand manager is, maybe you've had a phone call, maybe you've sort of made this like initial contact. You're sending this. Is it a pitch deck? Oh yeah, okay. you put a deck, and then you actually even try and show how their brand is going to be seen in the content as well. And then you give them how much time to kind of look at it. What's like the protocol? A week. A week, okay. And then you start badgering. And, and, and then you start calling? negotiating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 everything is so different. Like, um, I could have had some major brands on our billboards. They didn't want to necessarily give me money, but they would have done it in trade for a lot of exposure. And I walked away from those deals. Why? Because um, I felt like my project had more value. Um, and I just, I just, I don't know, like, like, um, in retrospect, I wish I would have for a couple, for two of them, quite honestly. 
Um, but I made the wrong decision. <laughs> Straight up, like I don't know what to say. Like, like, and and because um, we could have done some fun things, but at the same time, it might have limited us from other things. And also, two was one of them was, um, did I want them to be a part of the project? Deep down inside, what they're selling, did I really want them a part of it? Uh. And so that was that was like kind of like a gut call that I made, um, and um, yeah, right, right. Because the thing is, that's going to live on in your film. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't feel right about right, that, that makes right. sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm not telling you who it was. Though. No, no, that's okay. I'm not going to ask, but now my mind is going to all different places. Wow. Um, yeah. See, because you have to have integrity. That's the biggest thing. It's like it's like even though you're an entrepreneur and you think about you know the business side of the film business, you still have to have integrity and uh, a vision. You know, and that's the thing. It's like you can't sell out uh, because if you um, sell out. What are you gonna do next? That's such. A, I, you know, it's funny because I just watched this documentary on the Clash. Oh sure. And so it was like the because Joe Strummer passed away. Yeah. It was like 16 years ago or something. And I was li looking at all the comments, and you know, people were just oh they sold out and they became champagne socialists and all. But w who wouldn't want to go to a certain level though? Like I, I I get kind of frustrated with the whole sellout notion, and I realize that's a very indie argument because there's commercial, there's indie, there's the integrity of, of the creativity. It's funny, because I don't look at it as selling out. I think it's um, a different way of um, discovering your pain as an artist. Because I think that all artists are trying to overcome some sort of pain uh, so that they can be understood. I know I am, uh, so I'm only really speaking from my own experience, but. It's like, you know, you give the clash as an example, and um, I wouldn't say they sold out. They just figured out a different way to display their pain. Mm, um, you know, good. I mean, they did have they did have success, meteoric success, mind you, um, and um, in a form that wasn't even a form yet, uh, you know, a music form. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you can say the Sex Pistols before them, but... Um, uh, but did they get as much radio play as The Clash did? No, 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 no. I mean, The Clash went international, sure. not, not just out of the UK. But, uh, but at the same time, it's just a matter of like, I just think that, you know, who doesn't like champagne? I don't, I don't know what <laughs> exactly. to tell you. You still be a socialist yeah. and drink champagne. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just telling you, those, those, those yeah. are someone else's words, not mine. Yeah. Mind you, I don't think they sold out, but yeah. uh, it was just so fascinating, to that, that whole argument. So, yeah. And I know that, especially in certain genres, that's a very touchy thing, is selling out. In, in, in certain genres, whether it's punk rock or, or certain, you know, whatever style. You know? Well, it's funny because, like, you know, growing up, you know, as, as a punker, we had to have those people we'd call posers. Oh, sure. You know, those people uh -huh. that, that thought they were and wanted to be, but they weren't true. I've, you know, I've but then also too, it's like it's, like it's it's like it's like I've got friends that are artists and and that are actors and musicians and and so forth that feel like oh well they sold out. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean that they actually have some sort of commercial success and you don't and you're and you're jealous? Jealousy is an interesting sort of this poison arrow into that argument because I always feel like that's a lot of times where it comes from. Yeah. So Well, it's just like it's just like, you know, um Going back to the gatekeeper thing, it's also a matter of like, well, they got in and I didn't, and so are they jealous of those people that got in and they didn't? You know, it's a matter of, but again, it's a matter of like, where are, you know, programmers at? You know what I mean? So it's like, it's like, it's funny. It's because like, you can talk about gatekeepers, you can talk about jealousy, you can talk about all these things, but at the end of the day, your success is gonna ride on what you do, not what other people do to you. Mm. You, know, you have to work your butt off, like, and and I always think about like, you know, every no is is one step closer to a yes, you know, and and um, you know, and you know, I've had moderate success, you know, I, you know, I'm I'm not rolling in dough by any means. Um, yes, I pay my bills. I've got two girls in college, one in high school, um, you know, so you know, we live a family life, you know, and um, you know, it's not easy. I mean, my wife's also a photographer, an amazing photographer, and so we're both freelance. You know, and so, but we make it work, you know, because we work. You know, you, you can't sit back and say you're a filmmaker and not do the damn work. You just, you just can't. You know, even when you're, when, even when you're prepping for a film, you know, I, I, I want to try and see a producer friend of mine and she's like, you know, um, 
She's like, right now I'm 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 in pre-pro on a film, you know what that's like, and she's she's one of the producers on it. And um, and I'm like, we'll find the time, even if I'm walking to set with you or something like that, or you're doing location scouting, because I just want to catch up, because we did this panel out in out of Minneapolis and had a great time together, and I really respect her work. But it's just a matter of like, she is an accomplished producer, and she is still working 16, 18 hours a day. Wow. Yeah, she does, she's 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 doing what it takes. You know, and, and, and I give her so much props because of it. So So the notion of the sellout it doesn't really exist then. I think this the idea of a sellout is somebody that's not doing the work anymore. That they're that they're resting on their laurels of work that they've done in the past. That's a sellout, I think. Interesting. You know, it's not somebody that's still doing the work and still making money at it. You know, I don't think anybody's going to shame anybody for still working hard. But if they start to, if they start to like, like you know, rest on the laurels and like be like, you know, like flaunting stuff and everything else, you've got the time and everything else. I think that's where it's going to come down to. So even if someone goes mainstream, it's not a sellout in your opinion. Hell no! I, I'd love to go mainstream. Yeah, I think Billboard deserves to be mainstream because I really think that people are going to be very, very affected by the story. It's 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 about an underdog trying to succeed in our world that is so media heavy and how media plays a part in, in one's success or failure. It's a matter of legacy. It's a matter of you know, trying to do something really, really hard. You know? And it's a matter of um, giving people an opportunity to get ahead. And what they do with that opportunity is up to their own discretion. You know, some people are going to seize it. Some people are going to fail at it. You know, so it, it's this whole it's this whole play on a lot of different elements, and I'd, our film should go mainstream because it kick people in the ass and make them think about it. That you know what? Sometimes you don't win. You shouldn't get a trophy for not winning. You shouldn't get a trophy just for participating. You know, life's hard. You're gonna win. You're gonna lose, but you have to learn how to lose. And in our society today, everybody candy coats everything that you, oh you can't lose. You know, that's why they don't keep score at Little League games. That's horseshit. It really is. It's like, it's like, you know, like I lost a lot. You know, I've lost a lot in terms of, you know, monetary things. I've lost a lot in terms of I had a lot of friends die. You know, that's permanent. You know what I mean? But it's just a matter of like, and I learned from all that stuff. And that's one reason why I'm grateful that I went through the stuff that I had to as a kid, that my daughters didn't have to go through the same sort of thing. Cause I believe that, you know, there's so much universal negative and so many universal positive. And if I've got to deal more to the negative, that's great. So more people don't have to deal with it. I'm fine with that. I really am. And I'm at peace with it. But it's just a matter of like, you know, people have to learn how to lose in our society. And it's just like, you know, I don't know, grow a set. I don't know what to say. It's like, it's like, it's like there's so much, you know, you know, there's bullying going on because they're in, they feel they have inferior complexes. You know, they've got to bully on somebody else because like they think that they're better than somebody else without looking at themselves in the mirror and telling the truth. You know, there's a lot of this stuff going on and, and it's a matter of like, Billboard hits on a lot of these themes. You know, it also hits on the thing of taking advantage of people. You know, and, and, and it's a matter of like, you know, how our society with a lot of reality TV show stuff and everything else and, and social media that we've come, you know, humans on display. Like, like are, are we like literally watching other human beings almost as like zoo animals? You know, taking the, you know, taking the, the voyeuristic view and not participating in life. You know, it's just like, it, there's so many things that we hit on that it, 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 it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to say, but it, it, it's all wrapped around this crazy idea of a spectacle. You know, but we don't, we don't deal with the spectacle. We deal with the actual, what goes on behind the spectacle. The web series deals with the spectacle, but the film deals with what goes on behind the scenes. But I don't even know where I went with that. But it's like, it's like you know, it, it's making it is what we all strive to be. And, you know, you asked about the American dream earlier. It's a matter of like, as long as I can keep doing what I'm doing, I've accomplished the American dream. Is because like, you know, I'm still being creative. You know, I'm still providing. I'm still doing all those sorts of things. You know, um, do I drive a fancy car? To some, probably I do. You know, to some I don't. You know, and it's just a matter of like, but that's not what's important to me. What's important to me is that, you know, my family's provided for. That's number one. Then number two is I can continue to be creative. That's success to me. 
You know, however I have to go about doing it, I'll, I'll, I'll do. You know, and I'm not afraid to clean toilets if I have to. You know, it's all part of the, the, the plan for success. And, you know, you're not, you're not above it. You know, and, and also, too, it's like a lot of people in the film industry aren't as fortunate as I've been. Um, you know, that they have, you know, two or three different side hustles or stuff like that. But, but you know, so do people that have full-time jobs that are still trying to make rent. You know, filmmaking is no different. You know, and but it's a craft. That's a big thing that you know. The only way to be better at, to be a better filmmaker, is to practice your craft. Sometimes it's actually helpful. Oh yeah, I, I really do. Because you become the, you, you end up being a fighter. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. and, and 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 it's funny because like once you're provoked, um, you'll have the like the like you know, you'll get the fus. Like it's funny because I've gotten I I have turned fus into some major successes, um, and because I figure out a way to get around those gatekeepers. Um, and it's funny because like I've done some pretty, I uh, thank God I'm surrounded by, by people that are smarter than me and, and, um, can, I have ideas and they can basically make those things happen sometimes. And, and, and it's kind of fun, but, but, you know, sometimes, you know, getting your air up and having somebody not believe in you is just enough to push you over the edge to make you do something, you know? Yeah. I, I think we've. For, for some people, they, they've maybe had um, more coddling, and so maybe sometimes that's harmful. It might be great because then it's like, oh, tell us what you've done, that's great. But then for others who maybe didn't have that, I think it pushes you a little bit harder because if you don't have sort of this like cheering squad, it might. It you might. know, it, it's funny, it, is, is that, you know, we're, we're getting you know, some great reviews on Billboard, and I'm extremely grateful for them, and you know, um, I've had people that are in media as well ask me how I'm doing, you know, how's your, my mental state these days, you know? And I'm like, it's interesting, it's weird because like it's easier for me to deal with negative than it is for me to deal with positive. Uh, maybe because I've always had to deal with the negative and I've always, it's like kind of like the fight or flight kind of mentality. Um, you know, where I've always fought instead of, <laughs> instead of fleeing. Um, and it's funny because like, um, I still feel like I can be better. You know, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, maybe it's my own insecurity or something along those lines, but it's a matter of, of um, you know, when even in success, I think you can still be better at what you're doing and you still need to learn from it. You know, you, you can't say that, that you know, Scorsese or Spielberg don't, doesn't look at a piece of work that they've done that they've made millions, if not hundreds of millions on, and be like, oh, that could have been better. Or yeah, that could have, you know, or that could have been better. You know, you know, anybody worth their, you know, weight is going to always evaluate their work and, and figure out where they can be better. Is Jeep one of your sponsors? Yes. Okay. Um, how many sponsors had you already approached before you approached Jeep? And Oh, jeez. A lot. Although Jeep was one of the, the ones that I wanted. I, I love Jeep. Um, I... You know, I refinanced Jeep to actually, you know, it was interesting because I had an st interesting story to tell Jeep. That's how I think we secure them, quite honestly. It's a matter of like, you know, Jeep's been ingrained in my life since I've been able to drive. You know, um, my first Jeep was a CJ7 with a 401 in it, a three-speed, you know, dual exhaust. Like, it was a beautiful old Jeep that we refurbished. Uh, then I ended up getting one. Um, uh, I needed to, to get to my brother's wedding and I went through a bad breakup and gave her everything that I owned at that time and moved on. So I had to get to my brother's wedding. So I bought a Jeep with cash and that was a Jeep I refinanced um, to start my film company. Um, and um, so I had a story to tell Jeep. Yeah. And you know, my wife drives a Jeep now um, and things. So it's just like, so like it's been built into, into my DNA. In fact, there's even like a little blue Jeep a uh, toy that's actually part of our set pieces in the film as well, which is kind of funny too, so. So yeah. there was an emotional meaning to it oh, that absolutely. they probably picked up on. Oh, yeah, yeah, from, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just me well, hearing it's, it's funny, because you could say it, but then it's been reported in media over the course of my career. And and thank God that we do save a lot of the press clips and stuff so we can actually show them that like, yeah, look at me in on, you know, in Script Magazine from one of my films, me sitting on my black Jeep that I refinanced. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's like, so like you, you can't just be ass your way through this stuff. You actually have to, uh, to prove it. What do you think most filmmakers get wrong with their first movie? Let's say it's a feature. Oh, jeez. I don't know. Um, I can only speak from my own experience. Um, mm. 
What most filmmakers do wrong with their first movie? Um, I don't know. I don't know if they do anything wrong because it's a learning experience. What they would do wrong is not to make another one. You know what I mean? It's like it's like it's like, like I can't fault anybody for I can't I can't pick out one thing that people do wrong. Um, some stupid things that people do that I know of is like they don't clear things so they can't sell it. You know, that's just is that's just, you know, a, a dumb move. Um, um but I gotta say, like every film that one does is an experience to make a better one in the future. You know, so I can't say that, like you know, a first film is is something. Negative. Like I know what I did wrong, you know, and everything else, and I learned from it. And you know, my next film was better than the next film that was better, and like I keep you know getting better over time, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's one thing that I would say that most people get wrong. But I like that that not by not making a second. That, that it's true, yeah. Good. It's like it's like because if you make, you know, even if your first film doesn't make any money and you owe, you know, thirty thousand dollars in credit card debt or something like that, you know, paying off that debt and then doing your next pictures, you're probably your biggest disservice to yourself uh, because you then can actually make a better film based off of those things that you learned from your first one. You know, um, yeah, I, I that's the biggest thing. It's like, yeah. I think in another interview you said you, you run a tight ship on set. Oh, I do. It's great. Yeah. What are five things a director needs to do when they first get on set? Okay. So are you referring to just the as a director or are you talking about a director-producer? Let's try a director-producer. Okay, because that's what I do. Um, I've never had the luxury of just being a director. That's why I have to ask that question because being a producer, you're worried about money from day one. Um, so what I do is I make sure that everybody's on time. Um, I'm, I am very, um, I'm extremely tough about that. I fired people because they arrive late, um, straight up just because, you know, you have a key that is late and you have 10 people standing around, even if they're 15 minutes late, 10 people times 15, you know, is basically an hour and two and a half hours of time you've, you've lost. When you're dealing with minuscule budgets, uh, that kind of stuff adds up very quickly, and that means money lost. Uh, so I take that stuff extremely seriously. Um, I rehearse my actors. I know what I want. I don't vacillate on set. Um, I know what I need to cover because I'm thinking about the edit. Um, I shoot for the edit, and then I give some freedom. Uh, I'm very much a stickler upon my script. Uh, very much so. I don't really allow much improv um, because, again, it comes down to budget. You know, with the web series, we let a lot of improv go because we had a different budget structure for that than we did for the feature film. Um, but um, that, uh, the one thing that I do too is I try and make breakfast for everybody. <laughs> uh, just because, um, one is it puts me in the mindset of what I need to do for the day, just by the repetition of doing things. Also, too, is a matter of welcoming people to the set that day. And then also um, the idea of uh, if you go into later hours, people are generally a little bit more friendlier because they know you fed them. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy. That's not why I do, but I've learned that that's, that's a benefit of it. Um, and um, it's just something that, like, you know, in my early career, I worked in the F&B business while I was in making films and stuff. Uh, which I strongly suggest anybody doing. Uh, I think somebody that works in the restaurant business uh, is a great proving ground for great filmmakers, uh, especially producers, just because you have to think about a lot of different things. And I can get into that whole other topic. But um, uh, I make sure everything's buttoned up. I make sure that we have call sheets. I make sure that uh, you know, everybody that I have a shot list for everybody. Um, I'm just, I'm very organized. In fact, it's funny because my wife always says like, I wish you ran the rest of your life like you're running your productions. You know, because everything can have its place. Everything's very specific. Um, you know, and it's not to say that, that, that like, you know, my, my, my sets are um, dismal to be on. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I just need that, that you know, uniformity so that we can rest. You know, so I know that everything's being taken care of. Because when you're producing and directing, you know, you're doing a lot of internal battles in your head because like, you know, like shit, I didn't get that shot. 
I need to take it again, but then you're losing light and then you realize that, oh my gosh, I've got to light this thing. It's gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna run over overtime. And so now all of a sudden, like I'm doing the math in my head and be like, oh wow, like, is it worth it? You know, and, and so you have these little battles in your head if you're a director producer. Um, you know, I always like also make sure I surround myself with like, you know, a go-getter like, you know, uh, Ryan is just, he's a beast. He just dug in early on and just got stuff done for me. Um, assumed a lot of responsibility, um, you know, and my entire team, it's a matter of like everybody understanding what the vision is and, and getting everybody to follow that vision. Um, my DP, Matt, um, you know, it just, it just, it's interesting. Um, you know, every, every film set has their own battle scars. Um, and big question is, would you go to battle again with those people? That's the biggest question you have to ask after a shoot. Um, and I've gone to battle with people many times. <laughs> so. Well, how is working in a restaurant preparing you for a film set? Oh, so many things. Um, so, as a waitron, um, you have to think fast on your feet. You also have to realize that you know, you're constantly pleasing people. You have to remember a lot of things. Um, you know, what you carry out of the kitchen, you should be carrying something back, so it's a matter of efficiency. Uh, if you're really good to the, if you work your butt off and you're good to the owner, the owner might even cater your your, your film shoot. Um, you know, you get a, generally a meal a day as well, so that means that you only have to provide yourself two meals. Um, you know, there's the idea of camaraderie and a matter of like, you know, getting through something that's very hectic, because uh, most restaurants are very hectic, at least at some point of, of a shift. Um, it's a matter of um, working on your feet for long hours. Um, and you also have to stay very organized as well in terms of, of regimenting in your head of what has to come next. Um, it was a lot of things to working in the restaurant business. It's funny because like I always tell everybody, the other thing too, better of like working in the restaurant business, like you can do your film business stuff during the day and then work at night, which is, which is what I did early on in my career. And then what I would end up doing is take off for, you know, six weeks to shoot my film. You know, and they always would take me back because I was a hard worker and things. But, um, you know, that's kind of like how I got through my early career. Any advice on screenwriting books? Like, What's the best screenwriting book you've read? I think Sid Field is still probably the Bible. Uh, that was the first one I ever read. Um, I write every day still to this day. Uh, I find writing probably... Um, I find writing very enjoyable, although it's hellacious at the same time. Um, because I know that's the only part of the process that I know is solely me. Everything else is, is pretty much collaborative, you know, uh, and it's give and take. Uh, when you're writing, you don't have to give or take generally, you know. Uh, I also take a long time. Well, it's funny, I will think about a script for at least a year or two before I ever commit anything to paper. Because hmm. uh, what I do first is I know the story that I want to tell and then I build out the characters and then I want to know, I have to build out the characters so well that they can then end up just talking to each other and then I can literally vomit out a script in days, generally how it works for me, and then I do rewrites from there. Um, but also too is, I only will create characters that I want to play as an actor. Um, you know, uh, I find that, you know, like my next project is gonna be a challenge for my two leads in a big way and, and um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, um, but that's kind of like why, like, I love writing. Um, and the thing is too, it's like with writing, uh, it's all in the rewrite. And the biggest thing with writing too, is like, I like to share, uh, what I, what I'm writing with people, uh, and get their honest feedback. I don't do it to people that are going to be yes, you know, say like, oh, this is great. Like I literally want real criticism. And also too, is getting back to the whole entrepreneur spirit in this stuff is I'm so bold that I will hold live script readings of my scripts for audience feedback. The audience literally pays to go. I pay the actors. I generally make money on my script readings. <laughs> and, um, but at the same time, it's very valuable because then I hear what's working, what's not working. Uh, and also too is get the audience feedback. Uh, it's again, all part of this whole story R&D that I've been very much involved in uh, and how I create. Um, and I actually, I have like four stages of that I find that you need to create 
to be successful. And this doesn't just go for film, but it also goes for if you're a musician or an artist, you have a dance company or whatever. And so it's a matter of something that I've been perfecting over the course of Billboard. Um, and it's it's funny because you mentioned the whole um, no film school. It's like literally what I wrote in no film school, the four stages of, of for creative success. Um, and I blogged about it and everything else as well. Um, but writing is, is, is the um, most crucial part of this whole thing. And if something's not working on set, it's also too, it's important that you actually sit down and, and kind of rewrite and make sure that it, that it will work. Uh, I mean, mind you, as I said before with Billboard is that when we got into post, it didn't, some elements just didn't work. Um, and so I had to rewrite. And, and Billboard is a very, very complex script to write because not only did I have to worry about the feature film, but I also had to worry about how it fit into the web series. So if I would change one thing in the film, I had to make sure it worked for the web series. So it was very, very complex. And also too is like how we're playing with media is that some, some shots we shot, we actually had to do three different iterations of that scene to get the entire scene. For instance, like, you know, we would have a newscast, a, 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 um, uh, a newscaster speaking on TV, but on the screen and the newscast was part of the billboard contest. And then that screen ended up being in another shot. So you understand? So like just what you had to go through to try and make this whole thing happen, that was a big, a big challenge with the, with the script. Literally having to like realize that one scene sometimes took, you know, three different pieces of, three different layers, I should say, to make the, the, the scene cohesive. Well, you said that you, you think about the idea for a film for maybe one or two years, and then basically you vomit out the first draft because you feel like you know the story and the character mm -hmm. so well. Do you give that draft some time before you go in for the rewrites? Or do you um, do it right I will, away? No, I, actually I do. I generally give it a, a week or two, and then I'll reread it. Uh, and then from right there is when I start to make notes. Uh, it's funny because when, um, when people ask me to read scripts, I break out a pen. And, um, and I will literally start, I, I just, I don't know why, but I literally, if it's a formatting issue or anything like that, and quite honestly, if like things are not right in the first 10 pages, I, I won't carry on. Oh, you won't? No, wow. not, You'll even if I'm that? engaged, I'm like, mm. rewrite it. It's, it's, it, you know, your formatting's off, this X, Y, and Z and everything else. You know, there's too many spelling mistakes. I mean, it's crazy. It's like, it's like, it's like, I know it sounds horrible, but if you're gonna, if you're gonna ask me to take my time to read something, make sure it's readable. You know, and it's, it's important. It's not just, just respectfully, it's important, I think. You know, I've had people that are like, oh, I've got this great script, you know, they give me a tagline, okay, sure, I'll read it, and then it's not even in script format. It's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, like, like, like I can't even read this. And the people don't understand either, is because screenwriting, there is a formula for it because, you know, as a producer now, like I know that a page is gonna basically be a minute of screen time. If it's a very black page, it's gonna be more than one minute. You know, black page meaning a lot of action. That's spelled out in the script. And so um, uh, you know, so I start thinking about budget. I start thinking about all these sorts of things when I'm reading a script, whether or not I could produce it or what I would need to do to be able to make it happen. Um, and so my, I'm always reading something as a producer first before I read it. I guess that's why I'm probably reading somebody's script because I want me to produce it. Uh, my own scripts though is I'm, I'm pretty, I'm very tough on myself. Um, and um, like I just write and rewrite and write and rewrite and write and rewrite. How do you know when it's done? It's not done until I'm editing. <laughs> the picture. <laughs> Quite honestly, yeah, because, because like because you know you still edit things in in you know you still edit things, so you're constantly editing. You know, on location, you're editing generally, you know, because you might not you know use a certain line or something like that. So it's funny. It's like it's like um, or somebody says something wrong, and then you all of a sudden have to adapt something to change it. So the script is still like yes, you have to lock in the script to be able to schedule everything to you know have your you know your your production plans and so forth. But at the same time, like the script's really not locked until post production. How do you know when a transmedia project is finished? When it all works, because it's very it's very um, like, oh gosh, the overall script for Billboard is 410 pages. Oh wow. Um, and if I would have, if somebody would have handed me that as a producer, I would have said <laughs> you're out of your mind. Um, 
really out of your mind. Um, and so like I just had to make sure, like so I actually challenged some, some um, students from Lafayette uh, to do um, some writing uh, for it. And then I ended up having to do a bunch of rewriting because of it just didn't, some things didn't work. Um, and just, I just had to do it. And so, uh, but the script ended up being 410 pages long. Um, and um, because the web series is just, it's, you know, over three hours if you put all the content together. Can we hear more about the process of writing the script and also how are you writing it and then writing the web series or you're not writing it at the same time? Or sure, so um, I write them independently at first. I generally will start with the feature script uh, because still, uh, still the, the feature film is still paramount in this whole creative process. Um, you, know, it has to, you have to have something to hang everything on. It's like what I call the main event. Um, and so the web series um, is secondary to that, and but it has to be able to fit into the to the film script. And what I mean by that is like certain story elements have to be parallel. Um, I then have um, holders, what I call them, that there might be a scene, the same scene in the web series that's also in the film, told from a different perspective, so that the audience knows that this is the storyline. Um, you know, and so it, it sounds very complex. And so what you need to do is you, still, you need to start to map it out. And what I'll do is I will print out each scene by scene. And what I'll do is I will tab out the scene. So it's a white page then and keep everything very, you know, um, very separate. And then what I'll do then is on a different color paper, I will then print out the web series and, and, cor and, and collate them together and then read them all in one, one continuous story to make sure that everything makes sense and then I'll start making edits from that. So again, what I do is I will, I will you know, tab out each scene, um, you know, have it all individually, and then I'll color code it with the web series uh, so that I can make sure that it's one cohesive story. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense to you? Somewhat. So with the 410 pages, how is that, if I'm reading it, is that like, is part of it in the middle, then we stop it for the web series, or I'm just curious how that No, works. it can actually read as one long script. One long um, script. Yeah, okay. so I don't really, so I know which is which uh, by the by the color of paper. Okay. Uh, and also just by being the author of it too, I know which is which. Uh, but it should be able to read as one cohesive story um, you know, when you're, if you're sitting down to read all 410 pages. And so when you're saying a main event and now it's taking place in the web series from another perspective, it, it just all flows because now you know it's somebody else's experience with that same event? Yes, like for instance, um, the set of the billboard, right? So the, the, the characters go up on the billboard in both the web series and also in the film. But then once they get up to the billboard, it's different, right? The radio station has what they have to deal with and the, the billboard sitters have to deal with what they have to deal with. And so that's like literally what I would call the holder. So that's like the literally the start of the web series and then part of the film. You know, then what might, what might be happening, like something happens up in the billboard, you know, the radio station um, jocks uh, react and then you see what is actually going on in the billboard. So it's like, that's how it, it all works out. It's a cause and effect kind of play. Right, okay. So when you would make a change to the main part of the story, um, take us through, through the process of then going back in and, and is it just, you know at this moment in the web series is a similar moment in the script and so just to go in and modify? Yeah, and also too, it has to be uh, something that is also provocative as well. You know what I mean? Like you can't have um, something that doesn't provoke that change. Uh, and what I mean by that is a matter of, um, if you change something in one, you might have to change something in the other. Uh, again, because a lot of it's cause and effect. It's, it's two different points of view of the same story. Um, but the, then the challenge comes in, then you shoot all this stuff, and then you're in the editing room, and you wanna make a change. So then, not only do you have to worry about changing the film that it makes sense, now you have to change the web series to make sure it makes sense and that everything actually works together. It's extremely complex, very, very complex. 
Um, and so there's a lot of organization that takes place. There's a lot of work that takes place and everybody has to be on the same page and everybody really, really needs to pay hyper attention to continuity. Um, because without good continuity, like this stuff will fall apart very fast. It becomes a mess. You know, and, and, and the reason that I feel that what we're doing works is because we paid so much attention to that. So you're releasing the web series. You've already released it, all the sections before mm -hmm. the actual feature film has come out. We did, yeah. And so, but it's funny is because people that see the film want to see the web series generally. That's generally how it's been happening. Uh, and so the people have been downloading the web series. They can go to billboardmovie.com uh, and then it's up on Vimeo right now. Uh, it will, the web series will be released on other digital platforms. Uh, but we chose that first because there is a paywall there because uh, obviously we need to make money. Um, and because uh, this content has just cost us a lot of freaking money. Um, and um, also we went that model instead of the YouTube model uh, just because of, um, we wanted people to buy into the story world, not just watch content. Yeah, you know, it's two different ways of, of looking at things, two different mindsets you're going to, to view content then. Hmm. Interesting. So if it was just, if you had all the parts of the web series uploaded for free, on YouTube where there was no paywall for it? You felt that people wouldn't be as engaged? It just was content then, I feel. You know, just more more noise out there. Like we do have we do have short aspects of the web series up on YouTube, but it's pretty much for promotional purposes, uh, for the for the longer um, episodes. Um, but it's just a matter of like one of those decisions I had to make is like where I wanted this to be to live and to be, to be seen. Um, and so it lives on Vimeo. Is, is the portal that we're choosing for right now. And will you put the feature film um, with a paywall online for people? Yeah, not right now, because oh, we're in theaters, mm -hmm. um, but we will. You know, well, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna end up on iTunes, uh, Amazon, Roku, AdRise, like all these other portals and stuff. Uh, just not in the US, but internationally as well. So with your tour, are you going overseas at all? I hope so. Um, it's funny because In Search of did better overseas than it did in the United States. Uh, I have more of a of a um, uh, European sensibility to filmmaking, I guess. I, I didn't know that. I, and it's not my intention. It just ends up being that way. Um, because um, I guess like, you know, I'm okay with things not being wrapped up in a pretty bow. Um, and uh, I'm more of a, a very authentic storyteller uh, and I don't mind the rawness of things. Um, and so like for instance, within search of, there was a lot of nudity in it. Um, and, um, uh, you know, our Britannic society has a hard time with seeing penises and breasts. I don't get it. I really don't. Or, you know, they find it titillating, which I think is a crock of shit. Um, and, um, you know, so in Europe, it's not a big deal. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm constantly pushing the boundaries on things, um, and storytelling. I mean, you know, we got an R rating, so it wasn't, you know, sex or anything like that. It's just a matter of like the human body. It's just kind of weird. Did you tone down any nudity or I don't know how much nudity is in Billboard, but there's no nudity. There's no oh no, I can't, I can't say that. There is a bit of nudity in Billboard, but it wasn't it, it was PG-13. So oh, it's I not see. Anything. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it's just like, as, as, as I was saying, it's a matter of, um, within search of, I found that my sensibility of filmmaking is geared very European. Um, and um, with billboards, kind of, I think, pretty much the same way. Although it's an American story, so it's going to be interesting how that plays out internationally. I think you said that you had a difficult time securing with in search of some of the male full frontal that some people didn't wouldn't even show it. Did I hear that right? Or where did you hear that? I said it. I said it. It's you, true. You said it in a video. I yep, think. I did. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure that I know where what you're referring to. So um, it's interesting that um, in our wonderful society that you can show any part of the female anatomy uh, and it'll clear various portal sensors, iTunes. Show any sort of male genitalia on iTunes, they will ask you to cut it, which I think is completely wrong. Um, you know, and I think it's sexist. I think it is one of those things that society has to change because I just don't think that, and the reason that there's a lot of nudity in In Search of is because you can't be talking about sex and sort of things without there being nudity. Um, and uh, it's not a matter of, it's not in any way gratuitous. Um, and there's both male and female nudity in it. Like I'm like, you know, like unbiased with it. Um, 
And it's just one of those things that I think is 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 nonsense. It's it's a matter of like I think that you know if you're gonna do one, then you know you should have the other. Um, and you know they did the same with Bad Lieutenant. Bad Lieutenant, you know they cut the uh, the food, the Harvey Cartel's food frontal on that too, on iTunes. Was that when he was in the car? I'm trying to think of that. He story. came after somebody. I forget the oh, exact okay. scene, but okay. but um, it's been referenced a couple of times, and and my my aggregator referenced it. And then showed me the before and after clips and was like, that's that's nonsense. But interesting. Do you think it well, this is a touchy, well, no pun intended. No, go for do, it. do you think that it makes men uncomfortable that are quote unquote straight to see? I and I we're really gonna probably get No, I I'm 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 um I uh Do you think that I don't happen? know the problem with it. The weird thing about it is Men will be in locker rooms. You have all these guys that are jocks and they're naked amongst one another. Right. And then all of, all of a sudden they see male genitalia on, in, in a film like, ah! It doesn't make any <laughs> sense to me. You know what I mean? And, right. and, so, and so like I played sports all my life. I've, I've, I have a, a panache for streaking for that matter. I think it's kind of fun. Oh, wow. um, so they kind of like let you know like, like how I'm about the whole damn thing. <laughs> Was that you at the Emmys? Years no, ago, okay. no, that was no, made you, the Super you Bowl. Been that was made the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, but no, it's just a matter of like I think I don't know why men are uncomfortable by it. You'll find these beautiful works of art, like for instance, David, you know, in Florence. Um, you know, obviously completely naked. You know, and it's considered a work of art. The same thing with you know even the female anatomy as well. Um, but I think that. Um, there's no reason why male anatomy has to be shunned. I, I don't. I don't get it. It's not like you f see the form of body. I think is attractive, regardless if it's male or female. Um, it's not to say that I'm attracted to. I find it attractive. Two different ways of looking at this. So if you look at at at, at body as a form of art in a matter of expression. Um, it's one thing. Once you uh, objectify it, it's completely different. Uh, and that's the things like within our culture is like so many people objectify, you know, body. And a body is a vessel for our mind and our spirit. That's what it freaking is. You know, and, and you know, yes, some are attractive, some are not. Um, just like some art is attractive and some art is not. And it's just a matter of like, I think that you know, um, you know, people with inferiority complexes are going to shun away from male genitalia, quite honestly. And I think, I think, you know, that's your own insecurity. It's, it's, <laughs> that's all I can say. Yeah. You know, so I've seen women get uncomfortable sometimes, but I think there's various reasons for that. You mean with, with women other women? Comfortable Sorry. about seeing other female? Yeah, yeah, I've seen that, and, and I think it could go to different things. It, it could go to maybe if they have a daughter. And they feel uncomfortable with a young woman showing themselves because they envision their daughter. And they would like, well, I wouldn't want her to do that. Or there's a jealousy factor. And some women have a spectrum of the jealousy factor. Some women are on the very, very end of it, which is they're not, they don't really care. And others are on the, you know, mm -hmm. red light and it's they're just totally pissed off. And then I think it's considered too um, provocative and women get fearful because they don't want to face their own issues around that. Well, it's interesting with nudity today, though, is a matter of like with the whole Me Too movement, um, you're going to see probably less nudity in films. Um, and I think that if it's not gratuitous and it's not gender biased, I think that it should be fine. Hmm. Um, that's the thing. It's a matter of like it all comes down to the bias. Um, you know, and the thing is like it's like, you know, when we were on the set of In Search Of, like, you know, it was, you know, close set whenever there was nudity. Uh, complete respect for it and everything else, um, and you know there was both male and female alike, and that's a thing. It's like it's like you know, um, and I don't know. Like like I just look at it differently. Like I'm not I'm not I'm not intimidated. I guess you know, and and that's what it comes down to. Um, and um, you know, and, and at the same time, like I, I express to my daughters the same sort of thing. Um, you know that it's a matter of like you know, your body is your own, and 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 that sort, and and you have to do what you're comfortable with. Um, and even, you know, with, you know, my next feature, there is nudity in it as well. Um, but it's not, you know, it's unbiased, you know, I just because it, it has to be. And there's a point to it. It's not, it's not, it's not because, you know, I just want to see TNA. I mean, 
you know, it's not that it is. It's not that at all. It's a matter of expression. It's a matter of vulnerability. When you see nudity in a film and you're telling a story, I think it should be really about showing the vulnerability of somebody, not necessarily, you know, the size of somebody's breasts. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. You know what I mean? Like, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. Um, what, why do you think inferiority stops people from wanting nudity in, in films? Well, I mean, you know, because they're not secure in their own sexuality or, or what their wares are, I should say. I think, you know, like, you know, some people like, um, you know, have an inferiority complex. It's a matter of like, well, like, you know, I'm as endowed as that person or he's more endowed than I am, that kind of stuff. Or even even with like female, like, you know, the whole body shaming Absolutely. stuff and everything else that happens. It's the same sort of idea. That's what I mean by inferiority complex. It's a matter of like the idea of they have something that I don't have or that I wish I had. And so they just rather shut it down. Advice for somebody planning a first time transmedia project. Wow, uh, advice on somebody who wanted to do a transmedia project. Um, one is you really need to flesh out what your objective is. Uh, because something just to do it because it's a fad or something just because it's cool is the wrong reason to do it. You have to realize it has to be built into the story's DNA. Um, you also have to have a reason for why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, anything that does not meet that objective is just marketing. Um, you know, so the big thing with transmedia is trying to tell a different facet of a story in a different way, generally on a different media, um, different medium, I should say. Um, and so it's the idea of um, wanting to do that and not necessarily, and also needing to do it to a point. Like with Billboard, the, I wanted to create two different sides of the same story. One from the radio's perspective, one from the Billboard sitter's perspective. Cause and effect. One thing does one thing, it affects the other, and vice versa. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, when you're dealing a lot with, um, you know, like I've got friends in that produce in the transmedia space and they do things very tech heavy. Um, my big thing is, is to not create the least amount of friction as possible for your audience meaning don't have to jump through hoops to be able to be entertained by what you're creating. Uh, make sure that it's accessible. Um, just to wow your audience is not enough. I mean, you know, AR became a big thing with Pokemon Now, uh, and everybody then wanted to do something with AR in the transmedia space, but to me, it's like the only reason to do something like that is if it's authentic to your story. Um, you know, because also too, is people only get deeper into a story if they feel it's authentic and that they want to follow the story. So that's a big thing too, is like making sure that you have um, the proper amount of interest in what you're doing, you know, that it appeals to the widest enough audience as well. Um, you know, we're still like working on finding audience for Billboard, um, you know, and it's growing, thank God. Um, and producing transmedia is, is hard. It's also gonna cost a lot more money, it's gonna take a lot more time, straight up. Because uh, it, it has to, because it's, it's creating more media, you know, and, and creating more things. You have to understand how you're going to market all these things as well. Because I got to tell you, I've spent the last 10 years educating. Uh, that's one reason I think, too, it's taken me so long to get Billboard out there as well. It's like I still speak on colleges all the time, you know, about transmedia and, and a matter of uh, like what this stuff is. And, and um, I just don't like the word transmedia. I, I, I call it a cine experience because we create live events. It's a whole It's a whole experience. It's not just media, you know, it's an experience in my mind. And so it's, it's, it's not only, um, it's for the creative and also the user and everybody's gonna have the same, a different experience of how they attack uh, the content. What's the, what are some of the, the most prevalent questions you get when you go to the colleges? Why, 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 why do this? Why not just make a movie? Um, and it's funny because my wife asked me that same question. Well, would you just stop doing this and just do a film? It's so much easier. And I can't because that's not how I create. You know what I mean? Like, like when I, when I, when we did, um, in search of, um, you know, I go on college campuses and like, you know, Indiana university wouldn't even let us show, um, in search of on their campus. And you have to realize Indiana University has a Kinsey Institute, which is like the Sech Education Institute in the United States. And in search of was even too provocative for them. And there's no sex in it. Doesn't make any bloody sense at all. 
you know, so the funny, the reason I'm saying that is like, because then we did all these different things on college campuses with, with, um, in search of, and I created, um, um, uh, experiences where the audience would watch the film and then they would share a story. Um, and, um, and the funny thing is, is like the religious right have actually really have attached themselves to the film, uh, which is very interesting, even though there's a lot of nudity in it. Um, and I find it very fascinating. Um, and so like even with In Search Of, there was that extra element of storytelling that we did, um, you know, a sponsor by Econom Company, all these sorts of things. So we were actually, you know, teaching about safe sex and things. Uh, but then also then with, so like I've been doing this is built into how I create, you know, um, you know, with AKA I built out installations um, of this, the character's apartment and things, um, and then had his band perform live in places. Um, and then with it, with, with Billboard, it's just a matter of, you know, by creating this crazy radio station enables me to do all kinds of fun stuff, you know, and uh, where people literally can go in and, and experience part of the story. Um, in a different way. And it has to be authentic. That's the biggest thing. You just can't do it just to do it. It has to be really authentic. Uh, and even my next film, my next film is about, is a love story. Um, and, you know, it still has transmedia elements to it because the lead female is a ballerina and I wrote the ballet that's in the film that I actually want to mount aside from the actual film so the ballet will actually be toured separate from the film. And then, you know, the lead, the lead character is a child. I've got an attorney that's also a writer and he has a book of poetry that, you know, um, I've been writing and things too. So there's all these different sorts of things that we end up telling the story through. Uh, but it's, it's how I create. I don't, I don't know any different. And so it's like literally been built in my DNA and that's one reason why I create the way I do. When is Billboard finished? Well, the creation of Billboard is finished. Um, you know, right now we're in theatrical release and what we're doing with the film is we're kind of like taking it to a market to market saturation. Uh, so we're literally screening the film in different markets around the, around the country. Uh, then it'll go to uh, the digital platforms and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we also are still hosting live events with the different bands. Uh, from from uh, the radio station um, and we're creating events around that. Um, and the web series is currently in release. You know, uh, there's still bands that are submitting music to WTYT. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if it will ever be done because I guess it'll be done when I probably turn off the radio station, maybe. Uh, just because like this thing's kind of like created a life of its own. Um, and that's the weird, interesting thing about, about creating in this space. Like, you know, and it's a matter of like, I created something that I gave over to the audience and they're doing whatever the heck they want with it. You know, and as a creator, that's a little scary because generally you're a little bit control freaks. Um, but it's interesting that like bands are still finding it, they're still uploading their music and we're still sharing it with people. And that's a, that's a cool and very powerful thing. Um, so in a way, it's still growing. It's like the blob, you know, it's, it's still out there, still getting bigger. And we're still trying to find, you know, a, a, like an audience for everything, you know, and, and we're determined. I, we, we firmly believe we have a really quality film in our hands. Uh, that's going to speak to a lot of people. And so we're going to take our time with it. You know, we don't want to just like, you know, be a flash in the pan and be gone. We want it to, you know, to grow legs, um, you know, and, you know, I think it's going to be some time yet and, and we're excited to share. So then the audience sort of the owns your movie in a sense that they're the sort of the it's not yours anymore, you know, the saying. No, no, it's 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 what they it's how they take it. It's interesting, like when we opened this past weekend, um, we had decent numbers, um, and we did. We were, we were being held over in all the independent houses. Um, the ones that we were in multiplexes were not being held over, which kind of tells you something about the sensibility of, of, of cinema. Uh, but at the same time, um, our audiences are growing, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, so that just more people were at the theaters on Monday than they were on Sunday. And it's kind of interesting that that it's kind of like growing, which is which is an interesting barometer, you know. So obviously, word of mouth is happening, and so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, when we get final box office results at the end of the week, where that all comes in from. Are you ready for your next transmedia project? Am I ready? I've already. I, I, I don't know if you're ever ready. It just as a, it, it's just a part of me. It's how I create, you know. Um, and um, 
I'm going to be working with, I think, some other people about uh, producing their own work. Uh, just because I, I done this, I've done you know um, the first transmedia project at Sundance with Lance Wheeler, uh, pandemic, um, and that was a big challenge. But we learned a lot from that experience. Um, and you know, I worked with uh, Lance and David Cronenberg at his installations that are going around to, to museums around the world. Uh, so I do produce other people's work. Uh, I've been very head down working on Billboard for so many years uh, that I actually would love to work on other people's projects. Um, and um, because again, like this is just second nature to me. I don't, I don't know how else to create. Um, and and I've got some amazing, talented people that have worked with me on this stuff that I think would enjoy working on something new.